uh, I would like to uh, ask you to uh, take your seats. Uh, we are about to begin. Uh, I have to say, I have the pleasure to say that uh, uh, His uh, Magnificence, uh, the Rector of the University of Warsaw, Professor Alois Novak, uh, gave us, uh, did us uh, an honor and decided to participate in our opening uh, uh, conference, uh, the opening ceremony. Uh, so, as you probably know, and the time of the rector is uh, very uh, precious and, uh, and short, so I would like not to prolong uh, my uh, introduction and uh, I would like to ask Mr. Rector to say some words. Good morning, everybody. Dean, ladies and gen gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor simply to be with you at least for a while. And the reason is very simply. We are extremely proud of our archaeologists, of their work, of their cooperation with you, with the people, with the archaeologists all over the world. Their achievements are very appreciated here at Warsaw University in Poland. And I hope I had the chance to visit some of them in di different places all over the world. And I felt the appreciation of the archaeologists also in any other places, both in Latin American countries or South American countries, in Asia, and also here in Europe. And there is also a second reason for being such satisfied, being during the conference at least for a while. Your presence here. I mean, they are people, as Bartek, the dean, told me from all over the world, joining the conference online, and some of you came physically to Warsaw. It's probably not the best time of the year, because usually November is rainy, cloudy, etc., etc. But I hope that the Warsaw University, and in particular during the conference time, you will have some sunshine and some sunlight. Hopefully the dean will be good host. And uh, if you feel that you would like to get something from me to discuss and the problem, the doors, of course, of the rectorate will be open today and tomorrow. If you need me on Sunday, I can be also on Sunday. Bartku, thank you for organizing this conference. As I know, the Explorers Club is the second organizer, so thank you, both of you. And I am very satisfied, and I am very happy that you are doing such good jobs, being earlier an institute of the Department of History and just now being an independent faculty. I don't know, I don't remember, it's the first international conference by being organized by the independent faculty or maybe second or third, but, but anyway, it's just the beginning of your new life, so conference is important. So friends, thank you for coming. Archaeology is also important because if we know better our past, probably we will be better, we will be better working and understanding also the future. So you are some kind of a bridge between the past and between the future. And again, I wish you all the best, feel at home, at the Department of Archaeology and at the University of Warsaw. We are very much interested in you to have a good time here with us. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now that's, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rector, for warm words concerning the archaeology in general, uh, especially on the University of Warsaw and uh, in the Faculty of Archaeology. I'm very grateful for those words. Uh, I have to say that we have strong background in the person of our uh, rector. 
so I'm happy because of it. Um, the colleagues, the colleagues, I will speak on behalf, uh, of course, uh, the scientific committee. Uh, so uh, let me uh, remind, because I told about it yesterday, uh, that our scientific committee embraces uh, our colleagues from um, from the University of Warsaw, but also uh, uh, from the other institutions. So we have uh, Mr. Marcin Jankowski from the Explorers Club. Uh, here with us, uh, but also um, uh, Professor uh, Andrzej Pyden from the Nicolas Copernicus University in Torun, but I have to mention uh, Professor uh, Waldemar Osowski from the University of Gdańsk as well, and two colleagues from our uh, Faculty of Archaeology, so Professor Ivana Modrzewska Pionetti and Professor Agnieszka uh, Thomas. Uh, once again, I'd like to mention organizing committee uh, for ladies whom you are uh, 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 able, you, you may ask for everything actually uh, concerning um, organizational problems. I mean, uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Magdalena Nowakowska, uh, Mrs. Magdalena Sugarska, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Małgorzata Mileszczyk, and uh, Ms. Joanna Staniszewska. So, uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Uh, them for anything. Uh, I would like also to mention uh, co-organizing, co-organizers, I mean the Explorers Club uh, with uh, the president, uh, Professor Mariusz Żukowski, who is um, uh, absent unfortunately, but uh, uh, the organi or organization is represented by the vice president, uh, uh, Marcin uh, Jankowski. Uh, who is with us uh, today. Uh, I would like also to mention uh, the uh, University of Warsaw, of course, uh, but uh, the Museum of the University uh, with uh, Professor uh, Hubert Kowalski, director of it, who uh, is uh, the person uh, in charge of that uh, ball uh, room, so we have an opportunity to, to uh, gather uh, here. Or we owe it to, uh, to him. Uh, I would like to mention also the financing, so the Ministry of Education and Science, National uh, Science Center, um, uh, and, uh, and I would like also um, uh, to mention uh, the patronage uh, in the name of, in the, in the person of the rector, but also the media patronage, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, Divers24 uh, and Archeovieści, uh, mm, portal as well as uh, uh, perfect diver. So uh, we are here um, um, that big group and uh, I would like not to, I, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Archaeology and the Scientific Committee but uh, I do not want to be too official actually. Uh, so uh, this is connected with the fact that we are in general, divers here, and divers do not keep the distance uh, and rather try to shorten the distance because we uh, have to rely on one another. Uh, our health, our life sometimes um, uh, is connected with it. So, uh, so keeping the distance is not help, helpful and not healthy, uh, actually. And taking into consideration uh, the list of participants, I have to admit that we managed to shorten those uh, distances uh, because uh, there are people from all over the world verbally, uh, as uh, Mr. Rector uh, said. So from Austria, from Greece, from Italy, from Netherlands, from Spain, from Scotland, from Kuwait, from Rapa Nui, from uh, Turkey, and some verbally from all over the world, plus, of course, uh, colleagues from the uh, from Pol Pol our Polish uh, colleagues from different uh, universities and museums. Uh, additionally, I would like to say that the thematical scope of the conference is also very impressive. So we have uh, problems dedicated to shipwrecks, but also trade routes, um, watery offerings, uh, uh, fish traps, uh, and also uh, the other problems connected with remote sensing or photogrammetry. So I think that uh, everyone may find something or some fields which are uh, very interesting for uh, him and, and uh, therefore I am quite sure that uh, our conference will be very fruitful. And this is what I would like to wish you. Uh, informative speeches, uh, really brilliant discussions and very friendly atmosphere of which I am quite sure because 
at the moment even we have a friendly atmosphere which was uh, uh, start, which started with uh, with uh, the introduction by our rector and i'm quite sure that it will prolong for the next days thank you so much and have a good conference Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcin Jankowski. I represent the Polish chapter of the Explorers Club. And it's my great honor and really uh, big pleasure to be here with you and to take part uh, in this conference. As uh, um, Professor Novak uh, mentioned, archaeology is one of the most important uh, science at the university because it brings the past and, uh, and present and probably future together. I would like to extend this and tell that in our opinion at the Explorers Club, uh, underwater archeology span is the most important part of archeology. span Why? Because this is like the science of the future. For uh, the last few hundred years, archeologists um, have made a lot of uh, discoveries on land. On the land of Mesopotamia, they found uh, cuneiform tables that enabled us to understand this ancient civilization uh, of um, uh, Mesopotamia. In uh, Egypt, they found uh, Rosetta Stone that uh, enabled us to understand all the history of ancient Egypt. And uh, we may only think what kind of wonders wait for us underwater if we think that 70% uh, of uh, Earth is water and we still do not um, have good means to do underwater archaeology. I mean, underwater archaeology is more difficult, is uh, like in its infancy, I may say. Uh, and it is uh, still the science, this branch of science that is developing and is the most promising. I think that in the next years, we will see discoveries underwater like Rosetta Stone, like cuneiform tables from, uh, from Mesopotamia. I think that what is lying underwater and waiting for us is absolutely the most exciting uh, in archaeology, in the whole archaeology. And we at the Explorers Club, we are dedicated to pushing uh, the boundaries of science. We are dedicated to saying about new things and uh, we are dedicated to uh, just uh, understanding new, um, new science. And I think um, we should remember that still more people walked on the moon than touched the deepest part of, uh, of the Pacific Ocean. And still the 70% of our planet is unexplored or is not enough explored and it is your i don't want to say duty but your privilege as underwater archaeologists to be leaders in this field and i think it's absolutely exciting time in, in which we are living now uh, that we can uh, witness your discoveries and i'm very proud that we as explorers club were able to help organizing this conference i would like to mention um, Ministry of Science and Education, who provided us with fundings for organizing this, um, this meeting. Thank you very much for this, and I would like to also extend my uh, gratitude to University of Warsaw that is hosting this wonderful uh, conference, and Museum of University of Warsaw uh, that um, let us stay in this wonderful venue uh, here in Pałac Tyszkiewiczów Potockich uh, Palace. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention uh, two uh, of my uh, friends and my underwater buddies, honestly <laughs> speaking, Magda Nowakowska and Małgosia uh, Mileszczyk, that uh, were uh, so much involved in organizing this uh, conference. Thank you very much. And I would like to wish you all very, very uh, good conference with great effects. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for, to begin the, um, let's say, scientific part of the conference. Uh, the first uh, uh, which uh, would speak uh, today 
uh, it would be uh, the keynote speech, of course, is uh, Dr. Ksenia Poli Jensen. Uh, she is uh, the employee of the uh, Moskot uh, Museum, uh, Department of uh, Archaeology, and she is uh, not only the, one of the best uh, uh, Danish scholars, uh, uh, but also one of the most lovely persons I uh, uh, know. So uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to, to welcome her uh, here. She's a great specialist in the field of uh, weaponry, specifically from the pre-Roman, Roman and migration period times, but also uh, uh, in the field of, uh, of water, uh, watery offerings. Uh, she dedicated her PhD uh, a thesis to the Vimose find on Isle of Funen, one of the best uh, and the most important uh, sites of that uh, type. Moreover, she specialized uh, also in the uh, ancient uh, archery, uh, and she uh, published the book uh, presenting uh, arrows and bows uh, from one of the most important, even maybe even more important than Vimose uh, sites offering uh, in Illerup. So, uh, a really very important person, very brilliant person, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ksenia Poli Jensen. Thank you very much. Um, for this beautiful introduction. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for letting me participate here. I'm looking very much forward to it. It's a privilege being here with all these knowledgeable colleagues. Um, I'm, always, I'm already having a good time and uh, it's a pleasure being here. So in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on the offerings and sacrifices and weapon deposits, or votive deposits of a ritual nature. I will concentrate on wetland deposits in lakes and streams and bogs and leave the open sea and harbors to others. Now, wetland deposits, what would research be without them? And what would museums do without them? An impressively high percentage of our museum highlights are found in bogs, lakes, streams, and other wetland areas. These objects, including bodies and bones from animals and humans, have provided us with a detailed knowledge of almost all aspects of prehistory, from what people ate, how they dressed, which tools they used, how landscape evolved around them, and much, much more. These objects also show us connection and the spread of ideas between people living far from each other. They show us glimpses of rituals, ceremonies, and similarities and differences in belief systems, and sometimes even the gods they worshipped. In order to provide an overview of the many, many different types of deposits, I'll concentrate on the Iron Age material, uh, from around 500 BC to 500 AD, and I will use a Danish fine complex with numerous types of offerings as a starting point. Illerup Ådal, Illerup Ådal, is a long river valley northeast of the present day of uh, present day town of Skanderborg in eastern Jutland, Denmark. The place is especially famous for its uh, Iron Age sacrificial sites, with the lar largest marked on the slide. We have Forleu Nymølle, Alken Inge, and Illerup Ådal. And just to explain, Illerup Ådal means Illerup River Valley, so the name covers both one of the main sites and uh, the, the landscape. Very confusing. But during the Iron Age, this marked river valley looks actually a bit like this uh, painting behind me. Uh, this marked uh, river valley constituted a number of small lakes and wetland areas around the Ilorup stream. Aside from these main sites, the banks of the stream are littered with bark pots and a number of other Iron Age small finds. The oldest of the three main sites is Forleo Nymølle, a so-called fertility sacrifice or non-military deposit site from the late pre-Roman Iron Age, excavated in the 1960s. 
by the edge of what was once a small lake, several depositions of pots, wooden objects, animal bones, etc. was found. The main depositions belong in the period from 200 to 50 BC, with more or less continuous depositions. The different clusters of depositions were placed quite close together. And the position of previous depositions must have been common knowledge, even though they could have been placed 50 to 100 years beforehand. One of the clusters hold the remains of two depositions, one just after 200 BC and one of another 100 years younger. This deposit is one of the most interesting of the site. There's a tree trunk down here that has been split and partially worked, partially worn down, leading from the shore into the area. This has probably served as a bridge used in connection with the offerings. Around the cluster of stones, whoopsie, this is a cluster of stones, a wooden idol was excavated, lovingly called Freya from Forlu. She is about 2.75 meters tall, made of oak that had been worked to accentuate the hips. Very close by, a bundle of flax was found and at least 13 or 14 ceramic vessels with residue of some kind of foodstuff. Two she-like ash sticks measuring up to two meters in length have been chopped flat on one side and had a crude grip at the end. The excavators suggest that they were used as a sort of percussion clapboard, you can imagine, uh, in the air. Another very interesting but mostly overlooked type of object is the stones. Bright stones of quartz and flint, not naturally occurring in small lakes in Denmark. Their proximity to other objects, especially the idol, suggests that they were placed there deliberately. At Forleo Nymölem, animal bones were often found in connection with the pots. And it's characteristic that animal bones play an important role in these so-called fertility sacrifices of the Iron Age. But it's rarely the whole animal. At Bokerup on Funen, Denmark, they excavated at least 48, 48 concentrations of material that is 48 different events taken place with different combinations of pottery, animal bones, rope, and tethering sticks. Many bones were closely tied to the sticks, indicating that the flesh had been removed beforehand. So it's not the animal that was deposited, it's the bones of the animals. And characteristically, only the extremities of the animals were present. And here's another example from Rislev Valmose with excavated horses. If we try to widen our perspective, we see a widespread custom of offering commonplace artifacts such as pots, stones, and animal bones in the wetlands. The objects themselves are found in other contexts as well. Pots, for instance, are often found in graves, both as an urn, as a single pot, and as part of a larger assemblage. The content, when analyzed, almost always contain different foodstuffs, just like the wetland deposits. And pot shards are also found in pits between graves, as seen on these urnfill cemeteries from southern Jutland on the right. <clears throat> Furthermore, pots are often deposited in the settlements, usually in pits scattered around the village and its surrounding areas but also as part of houses in connection with roof-bearing posts and under the fireplace. And when the preservation conditions are right, we find animal bones as well. In other words, these objects are found in all contexts possible. How then can we understand the meaning of the mixed wetland deposits? My colleague, Karin Johannesson, calls it the rituals of common things. She's tried to find a pattern in these deposits and concluded that there is no pattern as such. 
Rather, there is a selection of different objects that was combined in various ways in ritual packages. Sometimes a local variety can be identified, but even within the same wetland area, not two concentrations or deposits are the same. The question is, how do we explain this annoying lack of consistency? Well, firstly, it's clear that the ob objects had a meaning for the people performing these rituals and that the depositing offset objects expressed a form of ritual communication. Secondly, the rituals are set in a landscape that was central in the resource area of the local villages. The wetlands themselves are a resource for peat and bog iron, etc. Thirdly, these places are used multiple times and even though several years pass between each offering, the older offerings are respected. This would imply that there are local events taking place whenever the time was right. And the variation in materials, the different ritual packages, if I may, imply that the different objects have different meanings and then they were used to meet specific needs in the local population. I would call this ritual communication a way of using objects, place, and repetition to establish or re-establish some kind of order within a group. With the basis in the many wetland finds in general, and folio numeri in particular, we have the opportunity of reconstructing some of the rituals. At times, only a single pot was put down, but other times more elaborate ceremonies took place. An idol was placed near the banks of a wetland, using a tree trunk as a bridge into the area. The white stones could mark the beginning of the ceremony, opening a gateway to the other world, or perhaps they were used to close the passage at the end of the ceremony. Food and drinks were probably a part of the rituals and slaughtering of the animals as well. The rituals sound peaceful, almost idyllic, and harvest celebration definitely come to mind. But the reasons could be dire. Perhaps a harvest gone wrong, perhaps a prolonged period of starvation and illness. Different circumstances required different objects and actions, but always as variations within a dogmatic and well-known range of possibilities the ritual package. This ensured a clear and recognizable ritual communication. But even more troubled times could always be the initiator as seen by another fine spot in, within the Ilorp Valley, the site of Alken Inge. The Alken Inge site, sorry, <coughs> was excavated in the late 1950s under the name Vede Bro. Bro means bridge and refers to the positioning <coughs> at a natural corridor in the landscape, <coughs> precisely where the Ilorup stream meets the Lake Mosu. The site was excavated again in 2012 to 14 as part of a larger research collaboration. And the Alcan Inge site is spectacular. And the fine material is exceptional as well, as it mainly consists of human bones. Alcan Inge comprised several thousand human bones. And surveys showed that the bones cover a much larger area than excavated. So consequently, we've only excavated a low percentage of the finds from Alcan Inge. At this stage, several interesting issues should be noticed. Firstly, the, bone, the bones belong almost exclusively to men, at least 380 persons, primarily 20 to 40 years of age, dated within a narrow time frame in the first half of the first century AD. Secondly, 
Several bones show non-healed trauma wounds from spears and javelins and swords and possibly axes. The damages were relatively few on the left side of the upper body, consistent with protection of a shield. Furthermore, multiple injuries on the back of the skull and on the back indicate that the individuals were cut down while fleeing. Thirdly, the bones from Alcan show clear signs of post-mortem processing. There are cut marks revealing defleshing of bones alongside with collecting and sorting prior to the final deposition of the bones. The most prominent example is four male pelvis bones mounted on a stick in a mutually locking sequence of the left and right, left and right uh, side of the pelvis. Skulls are underrepresented in the material, but those present show signs of deliberate smashing and being held down by stones. Last but not least, the bones show signs of exposure to wild, wild animal six to 12 months before the final deposition in the wetland. Now, several scenarios have been put forward, but the excavator's interpretation is that a battle took place probably very near uh, the very narrow land, uh, corridor in the landscape. After battle, the deaf were left at the battlefield for six to 12 months before the final rituals took place. The bodies were handled several times after battle, and the underrepresentation of skulls in the material could indicate that they were collected to be deposited somewhere else. Apparently, both events, battle and ritual deposition, had severe consequences, both locally and in the larger area around Alcan. Prior to the incident, this area showed an intensive land use uh, that declined severely by the beginning of the Roman Iron Age, where the area conspicuously fast became forest, a timeline corresponding with the event at Alcan. This could mirror a decline in population. Perhaps the defeated army consisted of local forces. Another explanation is that the area was abandoned due to a new sacrilege status of the area. that the Elkan event could have a long lasting impression on people living in the area is perhaps the reason for the existence of the large lights last site of Ilog Ordale, namely the weapon sacrifice taking place almost 200 years later. The site of Ilog Ordale in the Ilog River Valley was excavated during two campaigns, resulting in approximately 40% of the 100,000 square meter wetland area excavated. All in all, roughly 15,000 artifacts were excavated. And as you can see on the slide, <coughs> both metals and organic materials are well preserved. The fine contain hundreds of swords, spears, javelin, shields, harness, horse harness, tools, purses containing the soldiers' personal equipment like jewelry, striker lights, comb, and so much more. The find is traditionally interpreted as a post-war deposit where the victorious party or parties sacrificed the war booty from a defeated enemy. This very specific type of weapon deposit is called war booty sacrifices or broad spectrum sacrifices and is clearly defined as many types of weapons and other equipment being ritually destroyed and deposited in a lake or bog. So not all weapon deposits are war booty sacrifices. <clears throat> It is important to notice that no human bones are part of the weapon deposits of the site Ilorup Ode. The excellent excavation and documentation provided several fundamental insights. 
many of the objects of several uh, rupsi, many of the objects were ritually destroyed, but excellent preservation allowed for refitting of several objects, illustrating that fragments from the same artifact could be deposited up to 150 meters apart. On the illustration on the right-hand side, you can see lines connecting parts of the same weapon found in different places of the bog. Most of the finds are found within clearly defined clusters, probably reflecting a widespread use of bags and purses. So when combining the same type of objects from different clusters, information on refitting and a thorough examination of the dating of the objects, this allows for the ident identification of four weapon deposits, of which three were carried out from the same promontory down here. And here has objects were found spread out in a sort of fan-like uh, fan-shaped pattern. The largest and most widespread Ilorp Ordei deposit A comprises over 12,000 objects sacrificed at one single event taking place just after 200 AD. One of the major advantages of the excellent documentation of the Ilorp Ordale find is that it provides several clues to the succession of different rituals at the lake shore. Many of these elements can be recognized in other weapon deposits, and it seems as though the ceremonies, at least uh, during the late Roman Iron Age, consisted of a series of carefully staged rituals with a remarkably consistent, even uniform expression within the large geographical area a mutual understanding of ritual communication. So let's go back to the early third century AD. We know very little of the events prior to the weapon sacrifices, but it's very unlikely that a battle or battles took place at the Ilorp Valley because of the topography. This point can be made for the majority of the war booty sacrifices, and in my opinion, rather than showing us the battle sites, it expresses a mutual understanding of where this type of ceremony should be performed. A dramatic river valley landscape with high hills surrounding lakes and wetlands. Furthermore, this landscape would already uh, have been used for various types of non-military offerings prior to the weapon deposits. And once an ideal site was chosen, weapon deposit, deposit ceremonies were repeated on the site. Analysis of textiles in the find shown that the weapons were bundled and textiled before the ritual destruction took place. And since most of the textiles are from cloth, their owners must have been stripped either at the battlefield or as part of the rituals at the lake shore. Prisoners must have, might have been brought, brought to the place, but since contemporary human remains are never found with these weapon deposits, we are none the wiser. During the sacrifice at Ilorup Ordeil Deposit A, at least four horses were slaughtered. The horses were all male between six and 10 years of age, and they are slightly larger than contemporary horses from non-military contexts. The Ilorb horses all show remarkable similarities regarding the ritually inflicted injuries. More than 70 wounds were inflicted on this horse uh, during the ceremony. Another horse received at least some of the in injuries while it was lying on its left side. And all these horses were killed by a blow to the forehead. And interesting, this is a completely different ritual from the non-military fertility sacrifices mentioned earlier, with the extremities only being deposited. So obviously, a completely different message was communicated. 
Now, killing or fragmenting objects prior to depositioning them in lakes is a defining element of the war booty sacrifices. And interestingly, special care went into destroying the most valuable equipment. Almost all equipment of silver and gold is ritually destroyed. Most of the copper alloy material likewise, but iron weaponry and iron fitting have not received the same amount of destruction. This idea of destruction and fragmentation can be found in all Iron Age aspects of life and death, and it's a key element in the war booty sacrifices. It's important to underline that this is not a sign of warriors going into berserk in a blood rage. On the contrary, the systematic rituals, for instance, regarding the wrapping in textile and subsequent destruction, clearly points toward a carefully staged series of rituals with uniform expression. Again, this sequence can be recognized in all other war booty sacrifices of southern Scandinavia. A very different ritual package than the more individually uh, performed fertility rituals. After transport, dismantling, wrapping in textile, and ritual destruction, many of the bundles have been sailed out on the lake, and some have been thrown out from the uh, promontory. May I also remind you of the platforms from Forleo Numulu mentioned earlier. There is no doubt that the event at the shores of Lake Ilorp just after AD 200 were dramatic and aimed at impressing both allies and surviving enemies. The atmosphere must have been intoxicating. We can picture processions and chanting and music and shouting and singing and drinking for days on. The audience actively engaging in many ways in the destruction, the singing, the chanting, by ritual throws at stone, etc. An event so memorable that it was repeated 25 years after with weaponry deposited from the exact same promontory in the lake. And yet again, from the same spot almost 150 years later. This is the point where ritual communication turned into ritual manipulation. A carefully staged visualization of both military, political, and ritual power. Well, of course, a number of different interpretation can be applied on this material. But the fact remains that the Ilob Valley was used for mo both modest and more spectacular ceremonies, and the villages on the surrounding hills carried the histories of the slaughter at Elken Inge and the weapon cults at Ilob Odel as part of a collective memory for hundreds of years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dick Senya. There's um, uh, in our schedule we have uh, we have uh, the discussion right after the whole section of uh, the speeches. Uh, I would like also only to to uh, ask you uh, to, or to, of course, to participate in that feast which was presented by Maxenia, um, to drink coffee during the coffee breaks, maybe not to sing uh, too loudly, and uh, definitely not to destroy anything. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, really, really very much, uh, Xenia. I would like also to thank you, uh, th to thank the uh, director of the University of Warsaw, uh, uh, Professor Alois Novak, for participation in our uh, conference. Thank you really, uh, very much uh, from the deepest part of my uh, heart. And now that's time for the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, that time, uh, that's me. So uh, I would like to, to deliver the speech dedicated to the Lubanovo site. Um, yeah. So it works, just to check. Okay, um, I would like also to, uh, I have one announcement. Uh, I'd like to say that the, th the fourth uh, speech today uh, would be presented in a poster version. So uh, 
our speeches would, would be slightly longer, but not that much. I mean, mine and uh, also my colleague uh, uh, Tomasz uh, Nowakiewicz. I will present uh, the site in uh, Lubanowo. It is situated in northwestern part of uh, Poland. Uh, I mentioned Tomasz Nowakiewicz, who, who was uh, the, the person who, who did the excavations or the survey there as a first one. Uh, he was the uh, pe person in charge of the excavations there from 2014 until 2018. Uh, the site is situated, as I said, in northwestern part of Poland. Uh, it is in uh, Banie uh, district. Uh, formerly it was called uh, Hernze before the Second World War. Um, uh, because it was the part of Western Pomerania, of course. It is uh, situated at the fringe of uh, Myślibusz uh, Lakeland, a small, maybe not promising, not very promising uh, lake. Uh, it is uh, kidney-shaped, as you uh, see. And that part, uh, that fringe, was originally the bay of the uh, lake, but it uh, was dredged. Uh, uh, and we owe it to the building, to, to the, uh, the building of the uh, of the uh, channel uh, connected with with uh, um, dredging. Uh, as I said, uh, the lake is not very big, uh, not more than 300 meters uh, in length, uh, and but it is deep. Now, actually, its depth is at the moment almost 20 meters, but. Originally, um, uh, in the beginning of the Holson era, it was probably maybe 30, maybe 40 uh, uh, meters. Uh, it is um, unique because of the fact that its sides, its bottom in the uh, um, littler part uh, is very slope. So it drops uh, down abruptly, and therefore the silt does not accumulate there in that part, which is really extremely rare in the uh, Polish area, but not only Polish, generally in lakes, in the lakes. Because due to the process of eutrophication, uh, the silt um, uh, covers, um, and the mud covers the, the bottom, uh, and its thickness is sometimes even more than two, three uh, meters, but normally at least uh, one meter. But it's not the case of our lake, because when two time, twice a year, uh, the um, water is mixing inside the body of water, I mean in the autumn and, and in the spring, uh, it slides down to the central part of the uh, lake. And therefore, uh, its central part is covered with uh, maybe several meters of mud, but in the littoral zone there is no mud. The bottom is stony, uh, clayish, sandy, but not mud. The only exception is in that part where we have the plateau on which the mud, the mud is um, uh, visible. Uh, it is uh, the place in which, uh, right after the Second World War, a, lo a lot of munition, uh, rifles, weapons uh, were put. Um, in the vicinity, uh, there's a, a village called Bani. It was a small town during the Second World War and, and before uh, the, the Second World War, uh, in which uh, the great uh, military operation, German operation against Soviet in February of uh, uh, 1945 was done. Uh, it was called Zonenwende. Uh, the Germans failed, but there's a lot of munition. There was a lot of uh, uh, munition in the uh, neighboring fields. So uh, all those weapons from the battlefields were gathered and in 1945 put in that very lake. Why that? I cannot say. Uh, Genius Lotzi, one may say. Uh, but uh, the collectors, the amateur um, uh, detectorists uh, who are interested in the problems connected with the Second World War, uh, tried to pick it up uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, they did it with the neodymic magnets. And by, the, by chance, they found also, uh, except for, uh, apart from, from the munition and, and uh, uh, rifles, also weapons, but much, much earlier. I mean, uh, spearheads, I mean, axes, ages, uh, arrowheads, and so on and so on. And this information were, was uh, delivered to uh, Tomasz Nowakiewicz, who began, to, who collected us. I mean, he, he arranged the expedition. Uh, I had an opportunity to participate uh, in it and, uh, and to do the uh, research. Uh, but uh, I'd like also to mention uh, that person uh, who, is, uh, uh, who was in those uh, times uh, uh, the youngster, the pupil of the middle school, uh, and he was the person who informed Tomasz Nowakiewicz, and the whole story began with uh, him. At the moment, he's a 
PhD students in our University of Warsaw. So, so it's a good, uh, let's say, uh, way of uh, the scientific development uh, in this uh, case. Um, but still, there are uh, uh, munition elements uh, visible, like that one. Uh, every year we pick up a few, at least, uh, um, examples. Uh, how do we do our uh, research? Uh, we do it uh, with the metal detector, of course, uh, but in a, a scientific way, let's say, methodical way. So we uh, place the axis uh, uh, lines, two axis lines, generally parallel one to another, but parallel also to the uh, lake shore, and uh, between them the line, the guide rope is stretched, and we uh, use the metal detector uh, um, moving along that uh, guide uh, rope. After reaching one of the end, we move uh, the ends uh, at uh, two, two meter, at one meter, let's say, and we go back and once again and once again. In that way, we cover uh, the zigzag-shaped path, uh, and every uh, single square decimeter should be checked by the coil of the uh, metal detector at least twice, at least theoretically, of course. Uh, we all also use uh, the pinpointer to uh, locate certain objects more precisely. And after finding uh, the object, we place, uh, we mark it with the use of a buoy, and uh, the buoy is uh, um, located with the use of tachyometer, like you may observe uh, it here. Uh, there are, however, some zones which are uh, troublesome. I mean, it's impossible to go to the reed zone with the whole diving equipment, so we cut off the reeds. We have the um, uh, permission from local authorities, of course, and in these areas we check with the use of metal detectors and uh, pinpointers in, uh, in, suit, in, uh, in uh, diving suits. But, but without the whole uh, equipment. Also, the um, part uh, adjoining to the lake is uh, checked, but with the use of no normal uh, land archaeological uh, methods. Uh, these are the results. Uh, so these points show places in which we found uh, important elements, uh, uh, important from archaeological point of view. Of course, also these are the examples of documentation. Uh, and these are the final results. So at the moment, these are the zones which we managed to check until 2020, and these are the zones from last uh, year. So at the moment, we checked roughly 60% of the uh, littoral zone up to four or five uh, meters. Uh, in the deeper part, it is impossible to check at the moment because it is covered with mud, as I uh, said. Uh, and the results, so there are a lot of weapons found there, uh, specifically uh, spearheads of different types, also javelin heads, so uh, the, the spearheads with uh, uh, barbs. Uh, there are also uh, arrowheads, uh, the smaller ones, the axes, these two are dated to the Roman period, but also some uh, handicraft tools, uh, craftsman tools like uh, aegis, uh, horse harness elements, this is el the element of so-called Kelberge, uh, which is uh, very typical of the Roman period, but also fragments of the chain reins were found uh, there. This is the uh, horseshoe, much later, of course, uh, and some uh, strange elements. Uh, this is uh, the element I managed to identify as, a, as an apex of the shield boss, um, uh, type Jan 7A, uh, there are also some, some knives, and that element is, uh, that utensil is more puzzling. It is a rod uh, flattened at the ends. In the central part, it is twisted. So in my opinion, it has something to do with the heat. So it is radiate, radiator, and uh, it could be the uh, cooking implement element or uh, the element connected with blacksmithing. Uh, so all in all, it, is, it should be connected with the Roman period stuff as uh, well. As refers to the weapons, uh, I said that uh, the most popular were uh, spearheads. Um, they may be dated with the use of uh, typological, on, on the basis of typological grounds uh, to the Roman period, specifically early Roman period, so first, second century after Christ, also the beginning of the younger Roman period, so let's say first half of the third century also may be taken into consideration. Some of the item, items are ritually destroyed, like bands, uh, 
uh, in that case, sometimes uh, the sockets or blades are scorched, sometimes smashed, the sockets are smashed, but it is quite rare, actually. The majority of them is not destroyed uh, at all. Maybe it is connected with the fact that we deal with the iron uh, elements. As uh, Xenia uh, said, uh, they were not uh, destroyed so frequently as uh, the copper alloy or silver finds. At the moment, we do not have silver finds, uh, and uh, copper alloy, there are uh, a little, uh, a, few of, uh, a few of them. Uh, in, uh, on certain occasions, it was impossible to uh, use the dating basing on typological grounds due to the uh, bad preservation uh, of those objects, but sometimes the fragments of uh, wooden shafts survived inside the sockets, so it was possible to take samples and to date them with the use of radiocarbon methods. It occurred that all of those samples are dated to the late first century after Christ, so they fit well to the rest of the objects. It was also possible to identify the species uh, of wood, so uh, oak and ash was documented. Ash is quite normal because in Scandinavia almost all the shafts were made of uh, the ash. Uh, the oak was strange, but in another uh, site of that type in Chaskova, which was excavated by uh, Tomasz Nowakiewicz, also the oak was um, uh, documented. Uh, so, we deal here most probably with the boar booty uh, side. Uh, so, originally it, it is, uh, it, 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 it may be uh, described like that, but uh, for years it was stated, uh, it was, uh, let's say, uh, cliche that uh, uh, such sites are known exclusively from southern Scandinavia. Uh, maybe central Scandinavia, but uh, there were no such sites to the south of the Baltic uh, Sea. Now we know that it is not true. Uh, I tried to collect, uh, to uh, make a uh, search uh, uh, um, uh, query through the archival data, but also I tried to uh, include the items uh, picked up from the lakes uh, by our colleagues from uh, Torun. And uh, so, all in all, and, and the excavations done by, uh, done by, uh, by Tomasz Nowakiewicz in uh, Czaszkowo, so all in all, I may say that uh, that image should be supplemented and it looks like that. Of course, uh, 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 dark points, I mean black ones, uh, show uh, the size of not certain character, but probably uh, the uh, war booty size, or at least watery uh, offerings. One of them would be pre is presented at the moment, it is Lubanovo, but uh, another would be presented by us together with uh, our colleague, our student uh, Agata Grzędzielska. Tomorrow it is uh, uh, situated in northeastern part of Poland in uh, Śniardwe uh, Lake. So uh, the situation has changed for sure. St another quite important factor is uh, the fact that we deal still with the lake stage of the um, war booty uh, side, so it's not evolved uh, into the bog like it was in case of great majority of uh, sites of that uh, type. So we combine uh, two specialties which are beloved uh, for me, I mean underwater archaeology and uh, interest in uh, weapons from the Roman uh, period. Uh, some of the materials are not dated so uh, precisely, so chronologically unspecified, uh, like, uh, like uh, arrowheads, spindle holes, some uh, uh, belt buckles, but generally they, they may be dated of course. Uh, also that uh, fishnet sinker uh, is not uh, uh, attributed chronologically uh, too, uh, too, sharp, too narrowly. Uh, but personally, I think that we'd rather deal with prehistoric uh, times. Uh, in case of some of the knives, it is possible to, to, um, narrow down its, uh, to narrow down its chronology to the Roman period. In that case, probably we deal with early modern uh, times. But there were also fragments of uh, further tools, like the hammer, which cannot be uh, dated precisely, however, taking into uh, account the fact that there are uh, a lot of uh, the other items uh, also connected with the blacksmithing uh, dated to the Roman period in such sites, it seems to me that, that probably we deal with the Roman period uh, stuff. There are a lot of bones uh, here. Uh, as uh, Xenia, uh, Xenia said, they are very important. Uh, they are connected in the, with the ritual. And actually, there are hundreds of them. Uh, unfortunately, they cannot be dated precisely because of the fact that uh, uh, the proteins 
uh, which uh, normally survived in bones uh, when they are laying in the uh, that they uh, they lay uh, in the ground in water they are flushed out so it is there is no collagen inside and um, uh, we did not try even to to date them with the use of radiocarbon methods uh, maybe we'll collect some money just to check but i do not uh, think I, I i cannot rely on it actually so we uh, pick it, pick them up of course we document them uh, and but generally we cannot um, uh, divide between the older or younger ones. That one, the skull of a horse, is of course young. Uh, we know the story of that horse. He got mad and went into the lake, and so he died. And uh, his skull, after 25 years, was picked up by uh, our colleague uh, Arthur Druska. But apart from Roman period stuff, uh, to uh, our, we were uh, astonished actually. Uh, because of that, there are, um, there are materials dated to the medieval uh, times, and for sure medieval times. That element is the fragment of, oh, sorry, uh, the fragment of uh, the spearhead dated to the early medieval times. Uh, the early medieval times. That one is probably late medieval. We have also um, the key to the padlock, probably late medieval, early modern times, uh, and uh, a few fragments of. Late medieval, maybe early modern uh, horseshoes, plus of course uh, pieces of uh, pottery. But those uh, those uh, uh, spearheads are very in interesting for us. Moreover, we have very well dated uh, axes, early medieval one, tenth, eleventh century uh, uh, one, picked up by our colleagues. One of them you may recognize in the end of that zone of, of that uh, ball uh, room, um, uh, Piotr Preis. There are also axes dated to the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century, so late medieval, early modern. Sometimes they survived together with hafts, which is a unique situation, as you may observe. After conservation, it occurred that there are uh, stamps visible on uh, them. Another two are presented here. Um, they are from three years ago, from three years ago. Uh, that one is uh, in uh, Carpenter's tool, of course, it is asymmetric. It has also the stamp on, uh, visible here. And that one, one was even more promising, looked more promising right after picking it up. Uh, after the conservation, it occurred that there is also a stamp uh, with the name Poland 2000. So it occurred that it is much more later than we presumed at the uh, very beginning. Uh, another very important uh, element, impressive one, is the spearhead, which is uh, Ogre shape, let's say. Uh, it has uh, the blade two sections. Uh, the lower part is normally placed, but the upper part is uh, situated uh, perpendicularly to the first uh, one. Uh, and uh, so it looks like an ogre. Uh, these are happy here. Uh, its uh, socket is quite uh, wide. Uh, it looks like that. May So have a look uh, at, the, at the moving uh, uh, slide. Um, its socket is wide, so it cannot be, in my opinion, linked with the Roman period. It's too wide, it's typical rather for medieval period. Moreover, the edges of uh, the socket uh, are overlapping. So it is also rather not Roman period uh, trait. It should be rather connected with the uh, migration period or uh, medieval uh, times. The only uh, parallel I managed to find uh, is connected with the Viking uh, era. I asked colleagues uh, uh, who are specialists in the field of medieval, even late medieval, early uh, modern times uh, weaponry, and they did not find any parallels. So the only parallel was found by the colleague of mine, Tomasz Nowakiewicz, who proposed that those elements um, are similar. But uh, we deal here with the arrowheads, such arrowheads come from uh, high taboo, but also I've managed to find a few of them in the publication dedicated to gl glacier finds uh, from the southern Norway. Uh, they were connected with reindeer, reindeer hunting, and they are also uh, uh, connected with the Viking era. So in my opinion, we probably deal with the Viking period stuff, but it was only the inspiration 
uh, whether, whether it was made by local people or the Viking or it was imported, I cannot say for sure, but the Viking inspiration, at least inspiration, is in my opinion the most probable explanation. Apart from it, we have, of course, the buckets, not fully preserved, but the uh, bows of buckets, which is quite understandable in case of uh, uh, the lake. Uh, there, are, there are a few of them, some modern, some, uh, some much older. Uh, in certain cases, I may assume that we deal with medieval times, maybe even Roman uh, period. Uh, there are also such elements, the, fit, the mounting of, uh, of the spade, but that one is ethnographic, let's say. Uh, for sure, uh, very similar is, is collected, is presented in the uh, museum in Myślibusz. It was uh, delivered by the local uh, people right after the uh, Second World uh, War, so from the left before and from the right after uh, conservation process. That element is uh, really strange. It looks like a stirrup, uh, but it, is, it embraces two uh, arched bows, which are secured on the uh, horizontal axis. Uh, the axis is decorated, it is thinned here, and uh, it is added with the hook. Uh, it is for sure not the stirrup. Um, it occurs to be the frame of the so-called framed purses, uh, very typical, very rare, of course, uh, in archaeological material, but typical for the late medieval, early modern times, probably we deal with the 16th century. However, it was, uh, that, that's a strange uh, find and not so popular in archaeological material. And another I would like to present uh, from the, in the left, upper, upper left corner, you may observe the film done by Piotr Preis during uh, his excavation of that element. It was situated 50 meters from the lake shore at the depth of two meters. It is a copper uh, cauldron with the bow, iron bow put inside. And inside there are also four plates brilliantly decorated, uh, and uh, they look like that after the conservation process, the two of them. They are dated to 1600, uh, so I cannot uh, explain how they went into the, into the water, 50 meters from the uh, lake shore. One cannot explain it with the use of, let's say, sacrificial uh, um, uh, field of, of thinking. Um, I think that's, that's uh, uh, too late. Uh, also, uh, uh, washing the dishes uh, can be taken in, into account, so that's a puzzle, really, and uh, as I said, uh, we have to think about it, but nevertheless, it's a brilliant uh, find. And another brilliant find uh, is a stamp, uh, which we found uh, nearby the uh, lake shore, at the depth of uh, one and a half uh, meter. Uh, it has uh, the coat of arms on it, uh, and it is the coat of arms showing the helmet, uh, knight's helmet with feathers and uh, uh, flora decoration around. And in the central part, there are two stirrups and leather straps crossed. Uh, and it is a, a coat of arms uh, of the family von Steinwehr, uh, who lived nearby in Zoldin, it is today it is Myślibusz, 40 kilometers from Lubanovo. Uh, because uh, uh, there was uh, another very important element, the monograph, uh, of uh, the person who owned it uh, survived, so it was, there were letters F, W, V, S, so we deal with Friedrich Wilhelm von Steinwehr, Prussian general who lived uh, there, who was, had the great career actually. He died in uh, 19, uh, 1809 in Berlin, but his, uh, during his, uh, uh, he was retired, he spent his years in his uh, own estate so probably he had something like the excursion to Lake Lubanova where he left it. But that's uh, like the touch of the certain person. So that's, uh, even though it is quite uh, young, uh, it is impressive, uh, at least for me. And another find uh, from the last, uh, from the year ago, uh, we found uh, that element. It is the piece of pottery uh, dated to the proto-historic period, let's say. It, was, it is the expertise uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Bartłomiej Rogalski from the National Museum in uh, Szczecin. But uh, the problem is that it was inside the log boat. And the log boat was uh, well preserved, however it was cracked, so it was impossible to pick it up and to document in a, a normal way on the shore. It was even uh, impossible to 
uh, transport it to the um, deeper part of the uh, lake. So we dis and at the same time, it was impossible to make a docu documentation because of the bad, very bad visibility in that year. Have a look. This is the slide taken in that year. So it was impossible to make any photos or drawings. So we decided to take a sample, uh, to date it with the use of radiocarbon uh, uh, dating, and decide what to do after. And uh, this is the place where it was found. It is the area where the plateau is situated, so it was covered with the mud, and that's why it survived. But the dating was, was really astounding. It occurred that, first of all, it is made of uh, Fagus sylvatica, so the beach, which is a very rare material for preparing uh, um, log boats, the only one from the territory of Poland. Moreover, it had the transom, which is also very rare and rather old-fashioned way of making um, uh, such log boats, uh, also the only one from the territory of Poland, and its dating was brilliant because it is dated to 4th century before Christ, maybe even 400 before Christ, so it should be rather linked with so-called Yastorf culture or Pomeranian culture because we deal with the borderline area uh, of those, between those uh, two uh, cultural units in these uh, times. Uh, so we decided to make a documentation, but uh, after the uh, uh, experience from the last year, we decided to do it during winter. So we went there in uh, February, uh, when the uh, lake was covered uh, with the ice, uh, and we did uh, under ice uh, ex uh, diving and, and documentation. You may observe some slides from those, uh, the, this uh, brilliant uh, adventure. Uh, and uh, it was possible to make many, many photos. Uh, however, uh, they had to be done with the uh, use of uh, uh, camera. A GoPro camera, and there were hundreds of such uh, um, uh, photographs uh, taken, and after that, uh, they were collected, merged in such, a, such an image. I owe that image uh, to Piotr Preis, whom I would like to uh, thank for that. Uh, so this is metals called structure from motion, and it is well enough in such uh, waters with bad visibility. This is a drawing uh, made uh, basing on that photograph and the reconstruction. So, first of all, it has the transom, and it is very rare. And uh, have a look at the uh, uh, movie in the uh, lower right corner. This is the groove in which uh, the transom was situated. situated. But also, the bow uh, is uh, really strange because it is, uh, I dare to say, zoomorph zoomorphic in uh, shape. Moreover, so the big shape, let's say, uh, moreover, it has the puncture um, uh, inside, so something was uh, uh, secured to it. Maybe, I don't know, uh, figureheads, uh, something like the decoration. I cannot say. Probably it was not connected with, uh, with mooring, for example, or anchoring, uh, rather uh, uh, not. Uh, so, and uh, I, may I may also say that, uh, that uh, uh, as you may observe, uh, it's, that that uh, finds uh, uh, made us uh, happy. My wife told that it is uh, uh, the, picture, the, the slide on which I'm uh, the most happy, maybe not ever, but at least from several years. Uh, it is not true. You will have the opportunity to look at, the, at another uh, slide tomorrow. So explain. Uh, that year, during this vacation, we were able to find also uh, uh, the transom, which survived. Uh, we also took sample. Uh, and we, we are waiting for the uh, results of uh, the identification of the species, uh, wood species, uh, here. Uh, all in all, that's uh, the plethora of problems connected with that uh, find. It is not only the war booty uh, side, uh, it's a problem whether it was uh, the same type of uh, war booty offerings like in Scandinavia. It is not that, that, uh, that clear, actually, for me. I think for, um, that's... Uh, we really deal with weapons which are known from local areas, but not, not all of them. For example, axes are unknown from the uh, uh, local territory. It is so-called Lubusz group, as refers to archaeological uh, classification. So there are no, uh, no axes known from that uh, cultural area. However, they are known from the central Pomerania, so maybe 
uh, the Goths, I mean the Vilbar culture, people came there and were, uh, were um, uh, won. That they defeated uh, here. So in the future, we would like to prolong with the survey. I think that three, four years uh, would be enough to do so. Maybe we'll try to do the exploration in the chosen part of the bottom. I mean, in those where we deal with uh, 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 numerous points, uh, numer numerous uh, finds. So. Uh, concentrations of uh, finds. Uh, in the future, I would like, of course, to, to reconstruct the paleoclimate and, and uh, late show uh, changes. And uh, finally, I would like to make, uh, to prepare uh, the book. Of course, that's just the, the idea at the moment, but I do have the title, uh, Lake, the case of Lubanovo. So copyright for me, and uh, I hope that we'll uh, succeed in, let's say, 10 years uh, with finishing that uh, book. Um, I would like to thank you uh, for the attention, and I would like also to acknowledge Artur Brzuska, Tomasz Budziszewski, and Pepper Price, and many, many more uh, people who helped us, also the students, um, also post-diploma students of our uh, university. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and now I would like to ask uh, uh, Tomasz Nowakiewicz, uh, uh, to deliver the speech, as the speech dedicated to water sacrum in the Middle Ages, echoes of an, of an ancient tradition and a new chivalric custom. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for uh, all organizer um, for um, uh, invitation for, for, for this conference. Anyway, I would like to say also that it's um, a huge challenge to say something uh, after uh, such brilliant speakers like Senja and, and um, um, Bartosz Kontne. I'm not a good speaker, but anyway, I'd like to, to, to present some colorful pictures. So, so I dare to think uh, that it will be a way for your satisfaction. Uh, and... Uh, mm, so, okay. And um, uh, once more, um, uh, what I would like to say um, uh, at, at, uh, at first, um, I must uh, admit that the terrible through is that I'm not the diver. Uh, anyway, I hope it uh, doesn't uh, annihilate me in your eyes. Um, dear, dear colleagues, the title um, uh, of my uh, report, Water Sacrum in the Middle Ages, is a kind of invitation to an exotic um, uh, sphere, exotic zone of um, uh, um, medieval period. It, it's quite far from uh, the zone of um, uh, water sacrum, which I uh, generally think um, uh, about. And um, I, um, the picture uh, uh, which is vis visible in the, in the first slide um, will be explained um, uh, later. Uh, okay. Uh, first, I, I would like to... Uh, I have to, to, to say what I will not talk about. So, the paper doesn't deal with um, uh, um, such finds uh, as you can uh, observe. We have a few uh, examples of uh, er, um, Viking period, Viking age, very, very special um, evidences of um, uh, uh, water cults. Uh, in the uh, uh, northeastern part of um, Poland, in the Mazurian uh, Lakeland, uh, in my personal opinion, in one of the most uh, charming um, region in, in Poland, we have uh, two sites. Uh, and thanks to archival da data, um, we know that um, um, extremely expensive, valuable um, uh, swords were placed in the bottom of the small stream under the stones. It wasn't uh, absolutely uh, um, accidental uh, activity, uh, accidental something. It, it, it was a um, ritual uh, activity. But it's a topic for another story. Uh, I will not talk about uh, underwater battlefields. We have also a very impressive um, 
example in uh, uh, Ostrów Lednicki, in the heart of the first Piast state, the first Polish state, uh, and a um, few hundred uh, um, uh, items uh, related with the battle. Um, in the mid of 11th century, it was recorded um, uh, there. Battlefield, um, battlefields in Ostrov Lenitsky is re related with um, uh, Bohemian right, plundering right, which finished the uh, story of fir first phase of um, uh, Piast uh, stage. I will also skip uh, this topic. Um, uh, another example which I um, uh, skip, it's uh, evidences of uh, neighbor conflicts. Uh, we have a few um, examples, few evidences of such um, uh, um, battles, uh, su such um, military activity uh, related generally in the um, uh, Middle Ages, in feudal times, in feudal period. And a case of uh, Mikozinski Lake, it's a good example. We have a sword, so the um, axis, as, as you can observe, the stirrups and, 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 and uh, arrow heads, and, and, and so on. Um, and so on. Uh, such military uh, stuff um, was recorded at, um, uh, in um, uh, trace of the, of, um, uh, of the bridge. Uh, as I said um, before, uh, we have uh, um, um, such examples of, of, of such uh, sites. But it's also not, I'm oh, sorry, not the uh, topic of uh, my um, uh, report. Pons Mercati, according to um, uh, Bishop Titmar of Merseburg, um, uh, famous uh, medieval chronicle, um, uh, Pons Mercati, uh, tow, um, uh, trade bridges, was an um, uh, element of um, uh, cultural, cultural uh, landscape um, uh, of um, uh, Pomeranian um, uh, communities. Uh, maybe, um, uh, Żółte said in Zarańskie Lake, sorry, mm. uh, it's, it's one, one, one of um, uh, example uh, of, of such site. It's generally related um, uh, with um, uh, economic, uh, um, uh, economic um, uh, uh, circumstances, but um, uh, um, uh, in first phase of um, uh, uh, of the, 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 the site, some some scholars, colleagues from from uh, Torun, um, uh, um, uh, have the evidence that um, uh, it uh, could be related with also some, some with, with some uh, cult uh, activities. And um, uh, the last um, uh, chapter, let's say, which I not not talk about, um, it will be a um, uh, huge, um, uh, quite huge um, uh, collection of stray finds where we felt a clear context and um, uh, source from um, um, uh, found in uh, Odra River in Stettin is um, a good example of um, uh, um, uh, such uh, finds. As you can observe, um, uh, discovered is perfectly uh, preserved uh, and um, um, uh, all the and, and, and just the, the, the sort is an um, uh, excellent example of um, uh, element of um, uh, medieval um, uh, equipment. Going to uh, the going, going to the to the, to the point, um, I would like to, to turn your draw your attention into um, uh, Chaskovo uh, uh, um, Chaskovo uh, site. Uh, thank you, uh, Bartosz Kontne, for your uh, I should say it before for for, for your uh, nice words. Uh, um, you mentioned um, uh, um, Chaskovo. Uh, and um, Nidaino um, book excavated uh, about 10 years um, ago and um, quite well known, uh, I dare to say, thanks to um, staff of very unusual um, uh, elements of um, uh, weapon and uh, uh, elements, uh, richly decorated elements of, um, uh, of the belt and, and um, uh, horse uh, harnesses. The stage of um, uh, Research is very, very initial and very uh, insufficient, but um, um, we have enough data to propose some uh, chronology, and uh, it should be according to, to uh, Ola Rzeszczarska, uh, according to, to some stylistic feature, it should be dated at, at, at um, the um, uh, last decade of um, uh, um, third and uh, first decade um, of uh, fourth century. Uh, I'm talking about um, um, 
stylistic uh, element, but, uh, um, so, sorry, um, but um, uh, elements, um, uh, items from, from um, uh, Czaszkowa, from Nidajno Bog, uh, are also a kind of a visit card of our institute, and uh, um, you can you know, observe a picture from, from um, um, main page of um, uh, our, uh, our faculty. Uh, it's a also a good uh, opportunity uh, to, 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 to make small um, uh, propaganda. And um, uh, one hour ago, Martin Jankowski said that uh, the, the most important part of um, uh, archaeology is uh, water, underwater archaeology. Uh, I'm not agree, let me not, be, let me be, uh, not uh, agree uh, totally. I think that the most important part of archaeology are um, um, colorful graphics and graphic reconstruction and it's a um, good occasion to, to, to present um, a vision of um, uh, Mariusz Kozik of uh, rituals related with um, Czaszkowo, quite similar to uh, Illerup Odel's uh, uh, Odel, uh, activity uh, um, which we know thanks to the uh, report of uh, Xenia. But after um, um, uh, short, short um, presentation. I, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention into a very peculiar um, uh, element, very peculiar item found uh, um, uh, in Czaszkowo. Uh, very peculiar because uh, not from, uh, not dated um, uh, to, to uh, Roman period, um, but um, uh, medieval. As you can observe, it's a fragment of an axe. Uh, uh, we, of course, uh, know and understand that uh, it's uh, not easy to, um, uh, to destroy the iron axe. Um, uh, uh, here we have a fragment of uh, iron axe. Uh, should, um, the rest should be, um, of course, um, uh, um, somewhere here, uh, the rest of, uh, of, the, of the blade. And um, um, uh, um, this, this, this item was um, uh, found in, um, among the uh, other, among the um, uh, Roman period um, uh, dated um, uh, items. Uh, what uh, should be mentioned? The local Viking Age uh, settlement doesn't exist at uh, medieval period. Uh, I should say before, um, this X should be dated at the um, 14th, 15th um, uh, century. Uh, a local Viking Age settlement doesn't exist. It was destroyed a few centuries uh, ago, and we are absolutely sure um, uh, that uh, destruction was almost um, uh, total. Thanks to uh, Teutonic's um, chronicles, we know that uh, this region in medieval period uh, was uh, almost completely forested uh, without um, uh, and the old traditional uh, settlement points. Uh, from the other hand, medieval settlement um, the, um, not appeared um, uh, yet. It, it, it was starting point of um, um, uh, Teutonic um, uh, settlement. Uh, but in this time, um, we have a, a, a fragment of um, a iron um, X um, uh, in, the, in the book. Another, an, an, another um, uh, element which should be mentioned, that it, it's a location. Uh, Nidaino Bok and, and Czaszkowo site is located. Here, here we have a, a map from, from medieval um, uh, period um, uh, related strongly to uh, Teutonic um, uh, stage. And uh, it's um, uh, located, uh, as you can observe, in borderline, uh, um, borderland of uh, so-called um, uh, Grosse Wildnis, uh, depopulated uh, uh, area. That's why I think it's uh, um, uh, co completely impossible, hard to, 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 to imagine that um, uh, uh, in such circumstances, element of uh, iron X um, uh, should be, uh, um, was lost, maybe better to say, was lost um, uh, by accident in a very special place uh, uh, like uh, uh, Nidaino. Uh, what's more, according to our colleagues from uni university, according to sedimentologists, there is a very special feature uh, in Nidaino Bog. Uh, it depends on um, uh, some uh, hydrological um, situation, but sometimes the water level is very, very, very low. So uh, it means that um, uh, sometimes uh, 
probably not, uh, not, uh, um, uh, not, 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 not every um, of uh, iron deposit from from uh, Roman pe uh, period, but some of them were visible again uh, in a later period. So, uh, in eyes of um, um, some numerous uh, settlers from um, uh, medieval time. Uh, Nidainobok was very, very, should be taken as, as very unique uh, site with old weapon and all items visible uh, sometimes um, uh, in the uh, surface of the, uh, of the book. And in such circumstances, we have a um, uh, piece of uh, iron medieval axe uh, with, uh, ornamented with, uh, with the cross. And, um, Probably it's not. Um, uh, it's, it, 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 it could be. It, it's interest, interested, and it could be um, uh, important. And uh, maybe not so 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 quickly. Um, uh, that, uh, that's why I I, I, I think that um, uh, mm, fact of appearance of um, uh, medieval um, uh, X is uh, not um, because of um, uh, accident. And okay, um, uh, we, we may admit that um, um, it's uh, quite likely and, and, and quite um, uh, probably, but uh, the problem is, and the question is, that uh, we are in the um, uh, middle of Middle Ages, we are in a Teutonic state, um, uh, we are um, in a, a moment on chronological scale after few a few um, um, centuries uh, of um, uh, Christianization. And it's a question why. The question why is um, uh, still um, uh, important. And uh, let's take a, a look into uh, some parallels. Maybe it will be possible to, to, to find an... Uh, uh, um, similar uh, phenomenon, and that's why I would like to invite you to the to the trip uh, to a few um, other uh, sites from uh, northern uh, Poland. And one of them is a, a very very small, um, uh, bigger stream uh, or, 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 or small river Tina near Elblanc. Elblanc is a heart of um, um, Teutonic um, uh, state, a uh, very safe place in 14, um, uh, 14 um, uh, century without any chance for, 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 for the battles or, or, or conflict or, or, or something like that. And in um, uh, not deep, uh, quite, quite shallow, um, uh, stream Tima, uh, 20 years um, uh, ago, more than 20 years ago, a very special sort um, uh, was um, excavated um, uh, um, during some, some um, uh, um, uh, hydrological uh, uh, works. And um, uh, what is um, uh, interesting, it's a richly ornamentation of the, of the pommel, as, as you can observe, uh, it's a almost uh, cross of Jerusalem, so-called cross of um, Jerusalem. Uh, we have um, also uh, standard, so-called Greek um, uh, crosses. Um, it's a gilded ornamentation of um, uh, pommel of knight's sword. Uh, sword um, uh, have been uh, excavated without uh, any uh, scabbard, uh, without any uh, other elements of the, of the, of the belt or, or, or um, uh, um, or rider uh, equipment. It was naked, naked um, uh, uh, sort in a shallow um, uh, uh, river. I tried to uh, talk uh, uh, about the reason with um, many colleagues, um, uh, specialists from, uh, specialists of um, uh, crusading um, uh, um, period and, and, and uh, from, 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 from many um, uh, uh, countries. And uh, according to common opinion, it couldn't be an uh, accident. Uh, that uh, it, it was impossible to, to just uh, uh, lost such uh, richly decorated mm -hmm. with uh, uh, rich um, uh, symbolic um, uh, contents uh, uh, sort. Uh, okay, but, but it's not uh, the only uh, example. We have um, uh, some um, uh, uh, 
difficult to interpretation um, finds from a Pregel River in uh, um, uh, Königsberg. Uh, now it's a um, um, central capital, let's say, uh, of um, uh, Russian part uh, on, 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 on part of um, Russian Federation. Uh, it should be. I, I point, pointed um, uh, at, the, at the map, uh, but uh, behind the page, uh, never mind. Uh, everyone knows uh, where is uh, a Kaliningrad uh, region. Uh, Königsberg, uh, um, it's a um, uh, main town, cap uh, one of, of the Teutonic Order uh, capitals. Um, and uh, in um, unknown um, at fact uh, circumstances, um, uh, in a Pregel River in Königsberg, um, a sort, very similar sort, um, uh, have been found many, many years ago. Now it's in the collection of uh, German Historical Museum in uh, Berlin, as you can uh, observe. Uh, also, extremely rich and uh, richly um, uh, decorated uh, item with um, a coat of uh, arms uh, um, uh, uh, with the eagle of um, uh, emperor sign and uh, and the lion. I will talk about the uh, lion uh, later. Uh, maybe it's um, visible uh, that uh, his. Uh, a tail, tail of, of, of the sorry, a tail of the uh, lion is uh, a little bit uh, unusual. It's a, it's a double, and uh, the question is the same. Uh, what was the reason? Why such um, um, richly decorated uh, uh, weapon was in the in the river in central part of Teutonic state? Uh, it wasn't impossible to. Um, um, uh, 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 take it back uh, in the case of uh, some 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 accidental um, situation, but uh, um, the sort without any, any, any scabbard, without any, any element, was placed uh, in the in the river. Um, and um, uh, the third uh, example in um, uh, um, uh, in. Uh, Western part of uh, Poland in the borderland of um, uh, Pomerania, uh, Lubanovo, uh, uh, which you know, uh, thanks to um, the report of Bartosz Kontny, is uh, very, very, very close. It's almost the, sa the same um, uh, region. Uh, Mm, by the hand, uh, mm, excuse me, I should say said it before. Uh, thank you very much for your for your um, uh, words. Uh, yes, it's it's true. I had uh, I was lucky um, to to participate in first step um, um, made in um, Lubanovo, but uh, now uh, under Bartek uh, commands, it's in the best hands in in, in Poland. So. Uh, so it's a reason for, for, for satisfaction all of us. But going back to the, to the um, source, uh, we are in um, uh, some talk um, uh, near, near uh, Notage River, and uh, what's uh, probably more um, important in borderland between a um, few uh, historical uh, regions in uh, this part of uh, Central Europe. Uh, first of all, um, uh, um, Polonia Mayor, um, uh, Greater Poland, and Pomerania in uh, north and um, um, Lubuschland in uh, so so to, um, or also so western part and uh, the German um, uh, Brandenburgia in uh, western um, uh, part and um, uh, what we know thanks to uh, uh, archival data uh, about 150 years ago. Uh, another unusual sort have been excavated, have been found in, in, in uh, that um, region during peat uh, uh, digging close to the uh, Notage uh, River. Uh, unfortunately, the sort uh, disappeared. Um, they were not able to, to um, um, uh, research the item with um, uh, only documentation. Um, uh, from a uh, pre-war, pre-Second War uh, period. Finally, the sword from um, Santok was moved to, um, to the Wrocław, to the Breslau uh, Museum, and uh, it was his um, final um, uh, step in known history. Uh, anyway, uh, what is uh, important, richly 
decorated blades again, but uh, now uh, it's a case of uh, uh, absolutely um, uh, um, uh, um, maximal of uh, uh, maximum of um, uh, ornamentation. Uh, as you can observe, uh, we have um, um, uh, images of um, uh, mounted um, uh, knights um, uh, with uh, full armor, uh, with the shields, with the shields, with uh, with the spear, with uh, with helmet, um, uh, with full 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 armor. Uh, uh, as I um, said, said, said um, um, before, and with uh, crosses uh, on, on the uh, on the shields. In the uh, other parts of the of the blade, we have also coat of arms with cross uh, related. Uh, directly uh, with um, the tradition of uh, Teutonic order and um, a coat of uh, uh, arms um, uh, with other uh, content and if you remember uh, what I tried to um, show a few minutes ago, lion with the crown, crown uh, lion and with the tail but unfortunately the tail is invisible and uh, we don't have the, the item, we don't have the sword. So uh, the, 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 the secret uh, is uh, hard to, um, um, it, it's difficult to, 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 to be sure um, uh, what, was a, um, um, what kind of uh, tale uh, was uh, here. But uh, we are not completely without uh, any, any chances because um, uh, um, there are two possibilities. Uh, if the tail would be standard, single, it would be Thuringian uh, coat of arm. It would be double. It would be um, uh, Bohemian coat of uh, arms. Uh, in the second case, if you imagine something like a uh, uh, strand of uh, DNA, uh, it will be shape of double uh, tail of um, the Bohemian uh, lion. And um, uh, as I said, uh, we are not completely without any chances um, with um, uh, our um, uh, interpretation. Um, because we have um, 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 uh, written sources, and the most uh, important, uh, the most interesting uh, also, is um, uh, Peter of Dulsbos, Chronicon Terra, Prussia. It's a described, uh, um, detailedly described um, uh, story of um, uh, Prussian uh, conquest um, uh, made by um, uh, a Teutonic um, monk, uh, Peter of uh, Duisburg. And uh, one of chapter of, of, of his uh, op Opus Magnum is related with um, the Prussian crusade of Bohemian kings, uh, king, uh, sorry. And uh, in detail, tale it uh, described um, a story of um, 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 Bohemian um, crusade made by uh, King um, uh, Ottokar, uh, we have a few main actors of um, that uh, story. One of them is um, King uh, Ottokar, King of uh, uh, Bohemia. And um, uh, it's important to uh, admit that um, it was the greatest figure of uh, his time. Um, uh, in half of uh, 13th century, uh, he was a um, um, supreme leader of uh, all um, uh, region. Um, uh, I, uh, I mean, not only uh, Czech ter territory, but, uh, but, but um, uh, also um, nowadays uh, part of um, uh, Austria and, and the Middle East and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, very huge person and a huge figure um, uh, of uh, the time um, known as king of iron, king of um, uh, gold. And uh, except the others, he was also a benefactor of um, the Teutonic order. And um, uh, once he, he had an uh, idea to, to go to, 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 Prussia, uh, to Prussia and help Teutonic orders with um, the war uh, with um, uh, the strongest pagans uh, in Prussia, uh, uh, in, uh, with um, uh, uh, Sambians. 
Uh, that's why uh, Bohemian Crusade arrived to the uh, Prussia, and that's why and that's an answer for, 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 for the secret of the name of uh, Königsberg. Königsberg has his name thanks to Bohemian King uh, Ottokar. Uh, the other person is Margrave Otto of Brandenburg. Uh, we know that um, he was brother of law uh, of uh, King Ottokar. We know also that um, um, King um, Ottokar was presented to the, the throne of um, um, Holy uh, Roman Empire. Uh, so uh, he felt himself in German countries, uh, excuse me, uh, as an uh, I, I, I hope. We don't have any. Um, evidences in the, in the Polish historical sources related with travel of Bohemian kings to the, to the Prussia. That's why um, uh, we may presume that um, his, according to him, natural choice uh, was going through uh, nowadays um, uh, Eastern Germany and um, uh, Pomerania. And the sword from the Santok is just on the borderland. On, um, uh, on, on the line of um, his, his travel and in the uh, borderland of uh, Brandenburg, uh, land of uh, his uh, brother in the law, um, uh, Margrave Otto of uh, Brandenburg. That's why I, I think um, uh, we may set the, the um, question, could the sword with the images of the Teutonic Knights have been a, a honorable gift um, uh, from order to Bohemian kings or, or, or some of um, uh, his um, uh, companions? Uh, because it wasn't other uh, possibility to thank Crusader, except the, uh, some honorable uh, gift. The sword, richly decorated even, is a, 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 good, um, a, a good example um, uh, of, of, um, uh, of such an uh, idea. And uh, going to uh, conclu conclusion, we have a few examples, few evidences of um, uh, richly decorated swords, knight swords, uh, uh, swords um, uh, found in the rivers. Um, in one case, uh, it was quite a small river, Tina uh, near uh, Elblong. Uh, I will repeat, almost in the heart of Teutonic State. Uh, in other case, in Königsberg, it was a um, uh, sort with a coat of arms in uh, Königsberg, uh, um, uh, except the, the um, uh, Marienburg, the, the, the second um, the main town. Uh, and uh, the Santok in the um, uh, border of um, uh, Brandenburg, uh, which could be related with um, the, um, the Prussian um, uh, crusade. And uh, do we have any, any possible interpretation? First of them, uh, it's as lost by, by, by accident or by, um, uh, as a result of a uh, military action. And uh, I think that it's... Um, uh, extremely um, improbable, uh, extremely uh, unlikely. So uh, let's uh, try to, 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 to find uh, any other um, uh, solution. And um, uh, uh, there is a um, um, very interesting um, uh, item in the um, uh, Polish uh, Museum. Uh, I mean um, the cup of uh, Trzemeszno. Przepraszam, czy mógłby pan trochę przesunąć ten obrazek, żeby puchar strzemeszno? Dziękuję bardzo. Kapew Trzemeszno, example of medieval art, of course, without any doubts, but with a very interesting scene. One of them is extracting weapons from, from, the, from the water. According to all medieval tradition, it was an attribute of saints and the kings. Um, taking, taking back the iron weapon from, from, the, from, the, from the water. Uh, according to medieval tradition, it was an attribute of uh, King Solomon, it was an attribute of um, uh, um, a prophet uh, Elijah and, and uh, San Bernard, uh, Bernard um, uh, also. So uh, 
the iron in the water wasn't unknown uh, in symbolic words of medieval times. And uh, from the other hand, we have also uh, some single, not very numerous, but, but, but still interesting um, examples of um, uh, um, spiritual life, uh, let's say, or, or, or some kind of court um, uh, uh, tradition. I mean, um, uh, evidences of uh, Arthurian legends. And uh, you can observe three uh, examples. One, one of them with um, uh, King Arthur, and, um, uh, um, which is um, visible uh, in, a, in a fresco in the Castle Lockstedt. Uh, and in Loch, um, Castle, Castle in Lochstedt, um, uh, was um, uh, also in, in, in Teutonic, um, it was Teutonic state um, property. The, the other example, it's a um, um, townhouse, um, house of um, medieval bourgeois um, uh, in uh, Torun and um, uh, Knight's Tower in Shetland uh, in other parts of, um, of the Poland, uh, Poland. It's evidences of long life of uh, Arthurian tradition. So, uh, if Arthurian tradition uh, has its renaissance during medieval, was it impossible to uh, remember about water gifts, uh, let's say? And uh, if we have two uh, risky hypotheses, one of them is um, uh, mm, uh, intentional uh, activity. Uh, I think that it's more likely and more probably, because in the other case, we would have to admit that um, uh, medieval knights were, were, were fools, were, were child, they, they, they were, were, uh, uh, were not able to, to, to keep their, their, their swords um, uh, in, 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 in order. That's why I, I, I think that um, uh, we uh, may think seriously about chivalric um, uh, uh, tradition. And that's why uh, I, I uh, placed such uh, illustration uh, with um, uh, Sir Bedivere, the fur, the uh, good, the last companion of King Arthur who gave back uh, Excalibur to the, to the water. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tomek, uh, uh, dear colleagues, there's uh, time for the discussion. So we uh, begin with the uh, keynote speaker, Senia Pauli Jensen. Uh, please uh, come to the microphone, I think, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. would like to ask the question, please, Tomek. It will be not uh, surprising. Um, 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 do we have um, some um, uh, medieval uh, items from uh, Ilarup or, or Gimaza or other um, box uh, offering places? Yes, we do. We have actually several uh, medieval and late Viking. Um, Vi yeah, yes, yeah, from Vi Viking age. I know, but from from uh, late medieval. Sorry, I should uh, be more. Medieval. Yeah, I should be more uh, precise. I don't know, but I will check it for you. I don't know, but early medieval we have. Late medieval, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Viking age. I'll check. So maybe I would like to to ask the question: um, uh, Is that because during the? Uh, Rome conference, uh, brilliant, organized by Ksenia Pauli uh, in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen years ago. Uh, we were traveling uh, to the uh, place in, in, at Alkengenge where those deposits were made. Uh, so uh, during the discussion with Mats uh, Kalle Holst, uh, he told that um, there is a possibility that some of the uh, skeletons are connected with um, ritual uh, intentional killing um, uh, after the battle, maybe some years after the battle, it was connected with the crushed uh, skulls, with uh, um, utensils of uh, killing utensils like a uh, baseball bat or the element looking like uh, looking like that, or the uh, the other in shape as as far as I remember um, uh, of uh, the cricket uh, stick. Uh, 
Um, so is that true uh, after all those years of uh, work uh, with those materials? Um, well, something has happened since 2013, but they have actually found um, a club mm -hmm. uh, in connection with the, the bones, and, and they, are, they are quite convinced that these skulls were crushed deliberately. And clubs were definitely mentioned uh, in that book that I had uh, a picture of mm -hmm. as one of the possibilities. So it's, it's very interesting, this uh, idea of fragmenting, frag fragmentation. And I cannot help thinking about those big sites in France, uh, this Celtic site, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, where they also do uh, some things, well, funny things with skeletons, as we call it, um, where they put them up in rags, uh, but without their heads. Uh, so skulls have definitely some special meanings. And we see in other bog up in northern Jutland, in Svenom Bog, a colleague of mine is doing a project on the skulls. And it seems as though this is a place where um, similar, similar rituals took place, perhaps not after battle, but a place where skulls were collected and deposited. But these, these are whole, whole skulls, not fragmented. So um, I, hope that, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Some more questions, please. Do we know more of such sites? I mean, the ones with, with uh, uh, skeletons uh, or skeleton elements with uh, human bones, because for years it was stated that exclusively weapons were thrown into the lakes. Uh, it was something extraordinary for me, at least. Maybe there are some archival data concerning uh, such similar sites. There is there's quite a lot of sites with human bones, but they are never together with weapons. Um, disclaimer, sometimes there is, but it's um, also at Elk, uh, there are a handful of weapons, but it, it's not as though they are a part of the ritual. It seems like it was an accident they got in. But there are quite a lot of human bones in, the, in bogs from pre-Roman and early Roman Iron Age. Mm -hmm. And just think of the bog bodies. I mean, skeletons in bogs are just like the Tolan man, but without the flesh uh, and the skin. So yes, there are quite a lot of, of, of finds with human bones, but not with that uh, quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, Alcana Inge is something special because there are so many and because of the trauma, uh, the violent traumas on the bodies. Thank you. Some more questions, please. I cannot see it. So thank you so much, Ksenia, really. I appreciate your brilliant lecture. So uh, I am in a terrible situation because I have to ask myself to <laughs> go. Uh, so are there any questions concerning my uh, speech? Just a question: When you when you uh, record these weapons of the lakes, do they do you find them in clusters or are they just scattered around the seabed? Uh, we are in the let's say maybe not initial but still in the middle of the work uh, here. Uh, I may say that there are clusters in certain places. For example, in the eastern part of the lake, we observe concentration of Roman period stuff. Uh, it is um, in dis dispersed at, I don't know, several meters, maybe 25 meters. Uh, there are some more Roman period uh, weapons, but they are uh, single, singular finds in the other parts. But here in the eastern part is the concentration, and in the northeastern there is a concentration of medieval uh, finds. But for further, we cannot say at the moment. Uh, but uh, there are some, and this is why I assume that in the future it would be possible to uh, dig, all, to dig, to excavate in the deeper part which are covered with the mud, uh, in the places where uh, the concentrations adjoin the parts covered with mud. So, so there are. Some more questions? I 
if not, we may come to the uh, third speaker, I mean, uh, Tomasz Nowakiewicz. Uh, do you have any questions to that uh, speech? So to the medieval times. Katarzyna Czarnecka. I would like to add, because it was uh, very interesting, of course, I'm not a specialist of the late Middle Ages, but still it was so, so interesting. I would like to ask if there are any traces of the special devotion to Arthurian legends in the Teutonic order. We, because it could be some, maybe. Uh, um, starting from from um, 14th century, uh, uh, Teutonic orders um, uh, tried to, to to be much more popular uh, for um, uh, and open for uh, knight culture and court culture. That's why um, uh, many of um, uh, um, nobles uh, arrived to to uh, um, uh, um, to Prussia, and uh, pure battle and pure conquest. It wasn't enough, I, uh, I think. That, 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 that's why in um, uh, um, some um, uh, uh, monks' life <laughs> uh, um, uh, appeared some changes. We know that uh, one of um, uh, Teutonic um, um, uh, masters, um, um, Werner von Orson, uh, tried to stop secularization and um, uh, move back uh, order to um, and typical for first year or years or decades of its activity, way of life, uh, but it wasn't um, uh, successful. And uh, I think the, the, the best um, uh, uh, evidence is a fresco from uh, Lokstedt. Uh, Lokstedt uh, in Sambian Peninsula, uh, now close to the Bautisk uh, with um, so, uh, Russian uh, naval base, um, uh, uh, was a seat of um, uh, Grand Master of, uh, of, of the order. So I think that we may presume that uh, some of um, uh, elements of Arthurian legends uh, were um, uh, attractive or interesting for, for, for them also. Maybe it, it, it was not for them, not for, for monks, but for, for, for the guests. But anyway. It was under my question that I believe that the Arthurian legends were more popular in the secular, you know, courts of, of kings and so, knights, secular, not more or less uh, <laughs> no, yet order of monks, which of course they denied monks, but still it was. That's why I was wondering if Arthurian legend was the maybe some, you know, the some saints should be more, more, more even you know, saints knights, but not not the Arthurian legend. That's why I was wondering if it's if it's not something here, not not stick up. Really difficult to, to, to explain, but, 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 but anyway, diff difficult to, to, to find any other explanation uh, if you have uh, extremely valuable questions. Please talk to the microphone. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, some more questions concerning the uh, last uh, lecture. If not, I would like to ask one. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to maybe uh, a small remark that such finds are, I mean, late medieval also, are known also from the Western Europe. Uh, for example, from the Rhine River in Bonn, uh, the 13th century uh, sword was found, unfortunately, without further observations concerning the, find, the place of finding. It is a brand new find, so, so that, that's uh, bad that they did not notice anything, but uh, uh, never mind, but uh, I'd like to, uh, to tell that uh, as refers to Nidaino uh, uh, X, uh, uh, also uh, such situation may appear also uh, as you said, because for example in uh, Lake uh, uh, Lednica, famous place full of early medieval um, uh, weapons, also some medi late medieval, uh, I have to admit, uh, including swords and uh, axes, but there were also uh, at least one axe dated to the Roman period, 
Piotr Kotowicz, I identified it as a Żarnowiec type, in my opinion, it's rather wrong, but surely we deal with the uh, Roman period uh, acts uh, singular fine. In majority, of course, we deal with uh, early uh, medieval uh, items. Uh, and uh, one, uh, maybe not remark, but the doubt, let's say, uh, the problem is that we have also the same situation in the Roman period. So we have swords uh, from uh, the rivers, many more than uh, previously uh, imagined. Um, uh, the, same the same discussion was uh, done during the conference, uh, Roman conference in Köln, dedicated to the weapons in uh, sacrificial context. It is the easiest part of the weaponry to find, to, to find by chance. I mean, the sword is big, so it is, it is easy to, to be found by chance by bypasser, let's say. Uh, so uh, so uh, do we really deal with, uh, with sacrificial, uh, with sacrifice, or it is just found, uh, lost by, by chance? Even, um, uh, I, of course, I'm not a child, but I also, I'm also losing uh, things uh, frequently, maybe not that big, uh, but uh, if I am to lose uh, such uh, an item, big item in water, it's not that easy to pick it up uh, later on. I lose it in, in my home, in my, in my room, maybe that's easy, but in, in water, maybe for me, not that bad because I'm a diver, but normally uh, it's not that, that easy for the knights in the chivalric uh, times. So uh, that's always uh, the doubt whether we deal with the sacrificial offerings uh, or sacrificial finds, or it is just uh, lost by chance. Yes, of course. Um, um, a propos, uh, first um, 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 uh, remark. Uh, good eggs still is good eggs. Uh, no, no, never mind. Uh, uh, is it from Roman period or, or mm -hmm. later or, or older? If it's if it is still usable, so 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 especially in um, um, some special circumstances, um, it will be um, used. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, your dogs are. Also mine. <laughs> it's difficult to find an explanation. Of course, the source are, are, are the biggest, and especially if we have archival data. In case of swords, it would be the easiest way to to interest a newspaper or, or, or some scholars or. or Members from from uh, musical uh, stuff, uh, yes. But uh, still, uh, it's very difficult to to uh, imagine how, uh, let's say, king's weapon could could, could be lost by chance. Mm -hmm. so, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I rather tend to sacrificial uh, character of those finds, but. Uh, I, I had the same problems uh, referring to the Roman period, but uh, but that's time I think to, to finish our discussion because I would not like to deprive you of the coffee break. So we have the coffee break for 25 minutes. Thank you so much for that session.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, after uh, this little coffee break, I hope you are invigorated with uh, coffee and full of energy. Uh, we are starting second session um, of our conference, and this, uh, it's, this session is devoted to shipwrecks, uh, which, uh, as I spoke sometime um, to my friends, journalists, they call shipwrecks that they are like capsules of time, perfectly preserved. This is very interesting part of underwater archaeology and very close to my heart. Uh, and um, we have four presentations. Uh, we will have one from Holland. We will have one from uh, Spain, from Philippines, and um, from Warsaw. We will uh, hear about uh, the archaeology of the site that is a couple hundred meters away from the place where we are right now. So we are uh, beginning with a copper plate wreck, the discovery of the 16th century wreck in the Dutch part of the North Sea. And the presenter is Zeger van der Brenk uh, from Skilltrade Periplus Archeomare. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to give this presentation here. Um, my name is Seger van den Brenk um, from Amsterdam. I'm actually uh, not an archaeologist, but I'm a maritime geophysicist. I'm specialized in site scan sonar and multi beam images, especially of shipwrecks. Um, but my colleague, who could not be here today, Johan Optebeek, um, He's a maritime archaeologist, and on behalf of him and myself, I um, have the honor to present the discovery of a 16th century uh, shipwreck in the Dutch part of the North Sea. Um, now, this story starts, started two years ago. Um, the biggest container ship in the world the MSC Zoe lost 270 containers in the North Sea, and it was really a big disaster. Um, you might think those containers are very strong, but in fact they're not. They're like carton boxes, so as soon as they hit the water, they will fall apart and they will sink to the bottom. And many of those were filled with plastics and other rubbish, so it was really a, a very big disaster. So the Dutch government made a plan to recover all the debris in all the containers. So in the months that followed after this disaster, a period of four months, more than 10 survey vessels investigated an area, surveyed an area of over 3,000 square kilometers, and they found over 6,000 targets, so debris from these containers. And this all had to be recovered. Now, that's not very simple, of course. And another problem was that the remains of the containers were scattered among 350 known wrecks. And the plan was to salvage, to recover all this container debris using very big grabs from salvage vessels. And of course, we didn't want accidentally to lift the shipwrecks, especially not the historic shipwrecks, because we have many historic shipwrecks. So before all the salvage operations could start, we had to study all the sonar and multi-beam images of all the 6,000 targets to make sure that it were really container debris and not ancient ship shipwrecks. So you can imagine it was a lot of, uh, a lot of work for us. Meantime, we discovered a lot of new shipwrecks, and then the operation started and everything went fine until one day in uh, February we got a call from the salvage company from the salvage vessel that they had lifted some material and they thought it was not related to the containers. Now as you can see here, they recovered a number of very big oak beams but also a lot of copper plates and they had three big grabs and they were all uh, recovered on the, uh, the, uh, the, the salvage vessel. So this was all brought to the port. 
And now we had to secure all the finds because it was stored among the real rubbish from the containers. This is from the debris from the containers. And these are the finds, the oak beams and the copper plates. And they were all stored in the port, so we had to secure the finds to make sure that they were not mixed up. Uh, first, the team started with the, the research on the, on the timber. There were a lot of oak beams, 15 very big oak beams and planks. And everything was measured, drawn. There were some photogrammetry models made. And it was concluded that the, uh, the timber came from a wreck with minimal dimensions of 30 by 7 meters. And it was a carful built construction, so it had a smooth hull and not clinker built, but a smooth hull. And at first we thought, well, this is not a very special frack, maybe 19th century, 20, uh, 18th century. And we started to look into databases uh, on the location where the, uh, the objects were found, but there was nothing in the uh, databases, so it was not a known wreck, it was an un unknown wreck. And then we concentrated on the, uh, the copper findings. Um, first, we did, of course, some, uh, some uh, <coughs> dendrochronological research on samples. And to our big surprise, the, uh, the dating was that the, uh, the trees where the timber were made from were felled in the winter of 1536, 1537. So suddenly we had one of the oldest finds in the Dutch part of the North Sea. We had never found such old beams, timber, in the North Sea. So it made it uh, a very special wreck. And then the copper, there were a lot of copper finds. Um, basically, there were three, uh, three types of copper findings. We had uh, big round plates, diameter of about one meter, weighing 30 uh, kilograms each. A large number of rectangular plates. And then we had uh, a, number, uh, a lot of packages, which were basically rectangular plates stapled together with a copper um, <coughs> wrap around it. And what was very interesting is that the, uh, especially the round plates, they contained stamps. So a lot of different stamps, but they all had the same marker. And it took us a long time to figure out what this marker was. And then we found out that it was a trademark from the Fugger family. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we did uh, analysis on the copper, and the first conclusion was it was very, very pure copper, 99% uh, copper and 1% lead. And from X-ray analysis and isotope analysis, it was um, concluded that the copper was produced, was made, in, in between 1506 and 1530. And what was interesting is that the copper came from Neusol, Slovakia. And, well, uh, as I stated before, uh, we have this Fugger mark, so it was uh, shipped by, uh, by Fugger. And what's the story about Fugger? Well, Fugger, the Fugger family was uh, a family from Augsburg in Germany and they controlled the copper markets in the 15th and 16th century. In fact, they were at that moment the richest family in the world. And they owned a lot of copper mines in Slovakia and they traded this copper all over the world. Now, the last uh, member of the family was Anton Fugger and he died, passed away in 1560. And after 1560, the trademark disappeared, so it was not used anymore. So if you find copper with this trademark, you will be sure that it's from before 1560. Um, this map shows a transport of the, the, the uh, metal, the copper, in Europe in the 15th and 16th century. Um, the copper was mined in the mines of Neusol in Slovakia. And then it traveled to Stettin and Gdansk uh, using the so-called Weichsel route. And from Gdansk, it went to Hamburg and then Amsterdam and then to the staple market in Antwerp. And from Antwerp, it was shipped to 
Lisbon and from there basically all over the world. Now we have some comparable finds of this Fugger stamp, this, uh, this marking. Uh, first of all, you have the famous copper ship in Gdansk. Yeah, There's a nice, very nice uh, 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 book about it. Uh, it's a, a little bit older, it dates from 1430, and as far as I can recall, but I'm not sure, this does, this was a lot of copper on this, this rack, but there were no markings of the Fugger. But then we have our uh, our own wreck in the North Sea. And there's another famous find, the Bom Jesus in Namibia, Oranjemund. And that one contained the markers of the Fugger family. And then finally, we have the Nagomeni uh, wreck in Malindi, Kenya. It dates around the same period, 1550. So this shows that the Fugger copper was shipped all over the world. Now, the Dutch government wanted to excavate the, the whole wreck, and this was done in the summer of uh, 2019. But before the excavation could start, we uh, made um, high res multi beam images of the seafloor to see um, yeah, what was there, what was still there. And because of the water depth, it's deeper than 21 meters, so it's difficult for divers to concentrate on the site. So we had to map the site in great detail. So we did high resolution multi beam, but we also did um, the bottom profiles using a parametric echo sounder to see what was hidden beneath the seafloor. And as you can see on this uh, example, we have some wreck parts buried in the seafloor. So then the excavation could, uh, could start. So a, a dive team of the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency started the excavation. Um, the, f the first thing uh, they did is made uh, a detailed uh, photo mosaic of the site. And as you can see, there was still a lot of copper plates there and also some beams left, but especially a lot of copper plates. So before they could start excavating the, the wreck remains, they had to remove all the copper. And that took a lot, a lot of time because there was much more copper than expected. It took them almost 10 days to recover all the remaining copper from the, the seafloor. And in total, they salvaged 7,000 kilograms. And then finally, when all the copper was disappeared, there was a little bit of a disappointment because there were almost no wreck remains underneath it. And um, yeah, probably what happened is that most of the wreck had disappeared, has eroded. Only the things that lay beneath the copper plates, they were protected, so they survived. But they were destructed by the big grabs of the salvage company. So there was actually not much of a wreck left. Fortunately, there were a lot of uh, uh, loose finds, among which um, um, a large number of small cannonballs and a small cannon, also known as a swivel gun. This is an early, uh, early type of cannon. And the interesting thing was that these cannonballs, they were not ready to be fired. They were not finished because the casting seams were still rough. So we think, or the team thinks, it might have been cargo, but they don't know yet. They're still, um, they're still uh, investigating these, uh, these cannonballs. Now then a final inventory of the copper could be made. As I said, we had round plates, a total of 205. Then we had these rectangular plates, over 600. And then 45 packages. And that added up to, well, you can still read it, more than 13,000 kilograms of, uh, of copper. And all the copper plates were photographed, measured, weighed, and an extensive catalog was set up with all the details on the copper. Um, then a uh, student, Stephen Feather, he did his graduation research on, uh, on the copper. 
Um, he uh, uh, concluded that the copper plates, all the copper plating uh, which was found, were uh, semi-finished products, so they were half products. Uh, all the rectangular plates were hammered, and all the round plates were casted or molded, and all the products were probably intended for roofing material uh, or to make pots, kettles, and pans. And especially the rectangular plates, they had a specific uh, uh, thickness. They were probably used to make copper coins in that period, because there was a lot of um, uh, there was a lack of small money uh, copper in uh, in those days. So the preliminary conclusions of the um, the rec were that it was uh, not too big. But we don't know yet. We're still investigating the, uh, the timber. But it was about 13 by 7 meters. And it was lost between 1538 and 1548 from Poland to Amsterdam or Antwerp. And it was probably a Dutch vessel, but we still don't know yet because we're still investigating. But it was for sure it was on its way from Gdansk to Amsterdam or Antwerp. Um, the copper plates, well, they all come from Slovakia, from the copper mines, and the trade stamps, um, it showed they were for the, for, from the Fuka family from Augsburg. And as far as we know, or so far uh, uh, today, it's the oldest known wreck in the North Sea. We have much older wrecks in Holland, but they're all in inland wrecks, and not on the North Sea, because on the North Sea, because, because of the currents and, uh, and so on, um, they will be lost uh, and uh, they will not survive. Um, the final report and the papers will be published early 2022, so they're not finished yet. They're still being worked on. Um, but I do have a question for the audience to, to finish with. Um, we have this Fugger stamp. Well, we know now what it stands for. But all the different packages where the copper was wrapped in, um, they contained a lot of markers and a lot of figures and symbols and we could not decipher yet. So we are still looking for an explanation what this means and maybe somebody in the audience has a clue about uh, what this could be. Thank you for your attention. Yes, of course. Ask you one question, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. I would like to ask you about this sub bottom uh, profile that you used, and you showed that there are some parts of the wreck still buried in the sand. Did you yes. excavate it with some wedges or something? Yes, we excavate, uh, we excavate it all. So after the copper was lifted, then all the, the remaining uh, parts of the wreck, they were all recovered. So there's nothing left on the seafloor anymore. Now we are moving uh, to Spain. Um, now uh, we will have presentation about uh, Punta Prima project, second century BC shipwreck excavation and in situ preservation. And the presenter is Enrique Aragon, Dr. Enrique Aragon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, conference. I've been in previous uh, editions and it's an honor to be back. Uh, today I'm presenting a proposal project that will be developed thanks to an agreement of collaboration between Warsaw University, um, the Balearic uh, Institute of Study in Maritime Archaeology. This project will be focused in the so-called Punta Prima shipwreck uh, dated in the second century BC and located in Formetera Island. But first, let's see where, where we are working. Uh, Formentera is, is the smallest island 
of the four islands that com uh, combine the uh, archipelago Balearic Islands. Uh, this little one uh, here, the very, very tiny one <laughs> in there, but uh, it's being, uh, the island is uh, every year received thousands of tourists who came to enjoy its clear water, white sandy beaches, and the range of nautical uh, activities around. Uh, Formentera has an incredible cultural heritage, terrestrial cultural heritage, and uh, since the 60s, it's been uh, um, handled like th a lot of uh, research projects. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not happening the same, uh, happening the same for maritime underwater archaeology. Uh, that's why, uh, in this context, we're starting creating the Institute, uh, the Balear, the Studies in Archaeologia Maritima, uh, which is aimed to research, preserve, protect, and disseminate the maritime cultural heritage and the underwater cultural heritage of Balearic Island in general. Uh, not just for Mentera, but also uh, Ibiza, Mallorca, and Menorca. Uh, we've been doing uh, several projects around the islands uh, in collaboration with the local administration and universities. Uh, actually, for the case of Formentera, uh, we've been working five years already in there, and we signed a new um, agreement for the next four years that's going to bring us to, to make um, not just the catalog of archaeological sites that we've been developing the last few years, but also uh, projects like Punta Prima, specific excavations. So this is the, uh, a little bit the, the context for the island and for IBM. But the gap of research wasn't actually the, 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 the biggest issue when we started working in the Balearic Islands. The biggest issue was like the social context, because in the island there is a big tradition for um, uh, private collections and recoveries of uh, archaeological artifacts, as you can see in the picture since very time, a long time ago. And so from this point of view, uh, IBM was setting up uh, a strong component of public engagement from the very beginning because we believe education is the only way we can change uh, the perception from local community to the protection of this kind of uh, heritage. So uh, in this project, Punta Prima uh, research project, we propose not only the excavation of the shipwreck and in a formal methodological way, but also to investigate and elaborate a bit more in depth and with a proper methodology uh, the, best, the best practice for local communities engagement. Uh, this means like uh, we're going to focus parallel in a parallel way in the research, proper research of the shipwreck, but also we're going to uh, complement that actions with several activities, creating experiences, uh, attracting the local uh, community to understand their own heritage. Um, on the other hand, Sorry, just a point, because this is very important. Uh, from our per perception, uh, this research is going to be focused, actually, theoretically, in the rule number seven of UNESCO uh, Convention 2001, that, as it says in that, uh, public access to in situ underwater cultural heritage uh, should be promoted, except where such access is incompatible with, with protection um, and management. But also, you, you should. Uh, Guarantee the the public accessibility to this uh, cultural heritage. Otherwise, the conservation is not uh, complete. Uh, in situ preservation is well uh, well known uh, uh, in maritime archaeology, especially since 2001 uh, UNESCO Convention was approved for most for a large number of countries, Spain uh, getting uh, into UNESCO 2001 convention in 2005. And uh, Punta Prima projects aim to contribute not only to the archeological research, 
uh, but as I say, uh, working with the local community. Um, sorry. Uh, following this approach, the efforts of this project will be embrace three types of audience, children, uh, university students, and recreational divers generating uh, integrative experience that are enriching the project, uh, exceeding the basic detail research of archeological site by the implementation of a public education uh, program. Uh, okay, let's see a little bit more of the uh, shipwreck itself. Uh, the so-called Punta Prima shipwreck has been selected as a case of study not just uh, for its uh, state of preservation, but also for its fragility. And I'm gonna explain this a bit further. Uh, Punta Prima Shipwreck is located off the west coast of Formentera Island. It is seated in 24 meters depth. Uh, uh, the discovery was to place, took in place in 2018 uh, during IBM uh, field work in the island during the inspections for the creation of the underwater archaeological sites uh, catalog. Uh, in the first inspection of the site, we discovered together with naval uh, architecture remains an Im important number of artifacts like amphoras, uh, 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 lead stock of an anchor, and a stone mill. So historically and archeologically, the investigation of Punta Prima shipwreck, uh, both the naval architecture and the uh, artifact assemblage, will allow the research uh, to acquire information on the transformation uh, of this region, which occurred in the second century BC, providing relevant information about the change that historically is identified between the taking over the Ponic presence in Balearic uh, Island and in the Iberian Peninsula to the uh, heavy uh, new geopolitical situation with the Roman Empire. <clears throat> on the basis of the initial uh, research, the wreck has been dated on the second century BC based on the artifacts that we discover. Uh, currently, the exposed area where we can see uh, part of the uh, shipwreck itself, the naval architecture, is no more than 1.20 meters and 50 centimeters. It's not a, a large area, but that gives us the opportunity to identify key elements in the naval architecture, like bronze nails or wooden pegs or uh, the mortise and tenons uh, technique. Um, and together with this, it's interesting to highlight that this uh, area received thousands of tourists. And this is what I'm saying, this, the fragility is one of the, uh, the goals or the urgency to work in this shipwreck. Because it's a very popular dive spot and used to uh, by diving centers. From Ibiza and Formentera, the accessibility of the site by recreational dive is quite easy and makes the risk of looting uh, more likely and less uh, manageable. But also, together with the visits of divers, uh, we have identified uh, a threat in physical, chemical, and biological uh, uh, nature in the degradation of, of some of the material we discover in, in here. Although uh, we have a very small portion of the exposed shipwreck we can see, uh, in the one of the first visits, the, the shipwreck itself uh, uh, having four planks totally exposed, and then these planks going through the sediments uh, is covering a large area that hopefully in the next few years we can uh, properly research. So Punta Prima project is directed to mainly two objectives, research and preserve uh, the archeological site with the in situ uh, techniques, uh, but also answer the educational gap in the protection of the maritime cultural heritage and underwater cultural heritage. Uh, since the in situ preservation, as we say, is a stage that we consider as fundamental, uh, uh, and we know uh, many of the techniques already applied, like the use of plastics polymers or the use of sandbags to reburial remains. 
uh, Punta Prima project will use didactic activities to analyze the perception and interpretation of local communities in relation with the uh, maritime cultural heritage and underwater cultural heritage. heritage. And the aim is to address not the universal abstraction of, uh, of engagement between community and uh, their heritage, but uh, ask for an active uh, uh, action of the community involving them with uh, the entire process. Uh, this process uh, up, uh, will be applied uh, in a longitudinal methodology, which means basically we're going to put emphasis in always the same uh, groups of, of people. As I say, uh, schools, I say uh, university students and local divers. So repeating activities with them gonna allow us to actually identify what is actually works for them in terms of engagement. Uh, and this is something like, uh, it's actually uh, not new uh, for us. Uh, this experience uh, has been developed uh, from IBM in the last five years, but it's being developed very, uh, uh, let's say in short term, very uh, specifically, what we want now is actually measure what is the efficiency of, of this engagement and this kind of program. Uh, I want to present now a video, but uh, this video is uh, showing uh, an activity we developed in 2017, I think, uh, uh, and it's called the Camp Dive. Camp dive that took the kids in the in the first gaining the first certificate for diving, um, putting them in an actual shipwreck, to experimenting for the first time, uh, together with the first experience in diving, uh, an archaeological site. Uh, the archaeological site was chosen by not just for security of the depth, but also for the low risk of impact. It's a 18th century shipwreck with uh, iron cannons. This was together with a diving center that was providing the certificates and ensuring the, uh, the safety, but also the local police that warranted the, the, the protection of the shipwreck and also help us to attach a feeling of legal framework to the entire uh, process. And it was supported thanks to the Council of Formentera Island. So now, yeah. Thanks. Say a few words. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> of course. 
So just a short remark for me for the end of this exquisite presentation by Enrique. Uh, when Enrique first contacted uh, us about this project, I thought that so far from my expertise, uh, it's not connected with what I'm doing in here at all. Oops, sorry. Uh, but generally, I don't know if you know that, Poland just became a part of convention. A few months ago, the convention was ratified in Poland finally. So this public access is becoming more and more important in here in Poland. We were trying, if you could, uh, sorry, if you could go back to the last slide, last slide please. So we were trying to involve at, as much as public access into our, um, the University of Warsaw's underwater expedition uh, activities up till now. We have, have some experience at, uh, with uh, lectures with children at the, um, at the festival in Biskupin, for example, and also the involvement of the divers, uh, which is the workshop, the field workshop, which we, um, f uh, up until now, f two times had with uh, incorporation with Nautica Diving Center at this island. Some participants of this, uh, of this workshop are even here uh, with us. So when I read about the whole project and it occurred that this, pu this public involvement and uh, communication of science is so much a part of this project, I thought that's wonderful because we can use our experiences and put them on the soil which our colleagues uh, from Spain represent, but later also check some, um, some activities which might become very useful within our projects, within this um, new situation that we found, uh, find ourselves in, which is uh, the situation, the reality of being actually a state party of convention of UNESCO. So thank you very much once again, Enrique, for inviting University of Warsaw to this great project. We, I, I really think we could do really nice things together and, and I think we are prepared for that and what's more, this, uh, this factual side from our Spanish colleagues uh, will be a great training for our students as well as we hardly any time have um, the possibility to take part in uh, in situ preservation situation. So thank you very much for listening and uh, that's all from Polish side. Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. It's uh, always so important to involve local communities, uh, to involve uh, just the general public in such projects, because not only um, it hooked them and they are interested in science, but also they may help us um, scientists with bringing some discoveries to our knowledge and they can, they can be really of great help uh, for scientific community, so this is excellent example of such uh, collaboration. Now we are uh, jumping a couple thousand kilometers to the east. Um, we are moving to the Philippines, and next presentation will be by uh, Marta Lazurek from uh, Faculty of Archaeology of University of Warsaw, and it will be about adaptation. How did local geography and climate determine the standard for ancient boat building in the Philippines. Uh, please welcome uh, Marta Lazurek. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so today I will show you um, and tell you something about the local geography and climate which determine uh, the standard for boat building in the Philippines. And I'm trying, I will try to um, run through this uh, presentation because the, um, this topic is um, very complex uh, so it's hard to present everything in 20 minutes. Um, so um, let's start. At first I have to introduce um, where we are. Um, the Philippines, uh, as an archipelago, consists um, about between 7,100 islands to 7,600 uh, uh, islands, it depending uh, on the government uh, website, uh, so the number is not uh, clear. Um, 
and they are, uh, the um, archipelago is situated in the Western Pacific Ocean. Um, the Philippines is bounded uh, by the uh, South China Sea on the west, um, the Philippine Sea to the east, uh, the Celebes Sea to the southwest, um, and by the Strait of the Luzon uh, to the north. Uh, the climate of the Philippines is tropical and maritime. Uh, it's characterized by high temperature and high humidity uh, and abundant rainfall. Um, there are three seasons, hot, dry, uh, season which lasts from March to May, the rainy season uh, from June to November, and cool, dry season from December to February. Um, and this climate is characterized also by two monsoons uh, as well, the southwest monsoon um, Habagat, which lasts from May to October, and north um, East monsoon Amihan, uh, which lasts from November to April. And what I want to mention, uh, the northeast wind was a um, favorable uh, weather condition to local maritime trade. Mm. Philippines have uh, 266,000 square kilometers of coastal waters, and the great number of islands of archipelago um, are located really close um, and form narrow channels uh, between islands. Uh, and in addition, the climate affects a coral, coral reef growth, so what makes uh, channels more shallow. Mm, and inter-island shallow passages um, were and still are uh, the trap for deeper vessels with the high draft. Um, so at first I want to say something about the techniques of building the hull. Um, the most uh, distinctive and characteristic in the, not only in the Philippines, but uh, in whole area of the Southeast Asia, uh, techniques uh, of boat building was uh, based on shell first technique and it is believed uh, that, the old, that this was uh, the oldest method widely known in the whole region. So planks uh, were carved to fit and joined by the edge pack uh, technique. Um, planks were fastened together edge to edge in the caravel construction uh, and sometimes uh, Planks were uh, sewn, but it also, uh, but it was also other method um, of boat building uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so when the shell was uh, ready, uh, the flexible ribs um, could be lashed to previously carved uh, lugs on each plank. So it means uh, that. Another technique which was uh, well known in Philippines and other regions of the Southeast Asia was slash lack uh, technique. And what I want to um, mention as well, uh, local boats were constructed with no metal fastenings. Other thing, um, it's sometimes uh, pegs were um, secured additionally uh, by small pins. Uh, sometimes they were made in a nipple. Uh, it was a hardwood which produces resin in a salt water. Um, and because of it, it uh, this resin became uh, become very sticky. So it was a great protection of the whole construction. And we can say that the pins functioned as nails. So to sum up this um, part, um, generally the hull um, which was built in, in this whale um, was flexible and light. Um, this is one of the description uh, how Spaniards um, 
think about the local uh, boats uh, in the comparison to their uh, Spanish uh, vessels. And um, all these techniques uh, about which I um, say before um, were confirmed by archaeological um, discovery from Butuan city, um, which is located in the Mindanao Island. Uh, first remains of Balangay, because the, this typical boat um, called Balangay uh, it's very special for the Filipino culture and also was called as a mother boat. Uh, so first remains were found by looters um, who were searching for valuable grave goods. Um, and because of it, um, many information about this, um, this excavation uh, are not clear. Uh, almost all boats of Butuan um, site have rectangular lugs carved on their planks. And another distinctive feature is usage of the edge pack technique. Uh, what I mentioned as well, um, in this case, uh, new investigation uh, didn't confirm the evidence of uh, locking planks uh, by pins in each uh, boat from Butuan site. Mm, the lugs were bored with holes uh, that allows uh, to lash the, um, and secure frames and forts of the boat. And what is uh, interesting about Butuan boats, uh, here is um, the scheme of um, how these um, techniques uh, were used in, in the example of the Butuan site, from the Butuan site, um, based on boat number one. Uh, so here you can see the whole way of the construction of the hull. And what is interesting about the Butuan site, uh, boat, uh, boats from Butuan, um, all lugs uh, which were carved in a keel plank were uh, different, were different in style, as you can see. Um, so it could mean uh, that the l way of lashing could be different as well. Um, what about the dating? Um, the last radiocarbon uh, studies um, show that the um, uh, wood samples uh, which were um, collected from Butuan boats um, were dated between 8th to 10th centuries. All of them were in the similar uh, the dates of all boats were similar uh, in this case. Uh, only one sample was uh, older and was dated to seven, between 7th to 9th uh, century. Um, another thing which is important, um, um, the analysis of the wood species, uh, which were used in Butuan boats uh, building. Um, this analysis uh, allowed to suggest what, what were boat builders' preferences um, and allows to, um, this identification allows to um, say which, uh, which type, of sh with which species uh, were used to carved um, boat components. Here you have this list uh, of the species uh, which were identified um, in the Butuan site and Butuan boats. Uh, in the blue, um, the species um, 
characterized by the um, that they were suitable for the maritime environment, and generally more of these uh, species uh, were characterized by a hard and durable uh, wood. Um, so I told you about uh, how the hull was um, was be be built. Um, so now um, I'm going to show you some uh, distinctive components and features for local uh, boats. Um, on the presentation, you can see uh, how the balangai uh, could look like. Um, so uh, the first uh, important thing is uh, double-ended vessel. This is feature. Um, this feature made the boat extremely uh, maneuverable. Maneuverable. Uh, in the case of the battle, paddlers were able to easily back uh, away the boat uh, and still drive it forward uh, by just turning around their paddlers. Um, on their um, uh, on their place. Mm. Other uh, thing is additional uh, platforms for mm, paddlers, were, uh, which were installed on outrigger beams, um, and this construction allows uh, to increase the number of paddlers to gain uh, the high speed of the vessel. And double outriggers, um, generally mostly uh, made, in ba made of bamboo. Um, their basic function, of, uh, their basic ba function um, is preve prevention of rolling. Uh, and outriggers also receive, as a first, the force of waves uh, and heavy seas. Uh, so, also, um, this whole construction uh, of our triggers allows easily pick up um, the vessel, for example, for, example, for beaching. Mm. And what is interesting, uh, the tripod mast. This is the construction way made mostly in wood or a bamboo. Um, and more precisely, it was a mast with two mobile uh, struts. And for technical reason, uh, reasons, uh, this construction of the mast was much more proper for a uh, flexible uh, hull. So the tripod could shift uh, its burden uh, with the movements in the hull. Mm. This is an, another example of a uh, very distinctive um, vessel, uh, very popular uh, in the Philippines, but it's not exactly Philippine um, vessel. It's Karakoa, and uh, its ori origin is uh, Indonesian. Um, so as you can see, um, here we have uh, same features and um, components uh, of the boat, um, which are repeating. Um, but in addition, we have a low freeboard, uh, which allows paddlers easily strike the water. Um, low freeboard, freeboard and shallow draft of the vessel suggest uh, that the boat um, wasn't intended to um, long distance voyage uh, for with the provisions uh, for months, um, or wasn't intended to to carry heavy cargoes. Uh, it was especially a battleship. Um, this main platform uh, was. Um, uh, especially for uh, warriors, which you can 
see in the middle of the hole. Mm. So uh, shallow draft, um, low freeboard and the shallow draft makes a boat less uh, responsive to currents uh, of channel and passages. Um, but uh, also we have some uh, disadvantages uh, of these um, features. Um, they didn't allow to sailing uh, the boat uh, in any wind. The de dead astern was the best weather condition for local boats. Um, and that's why Filipina and generally Southeast Asian uh, trade rates were um, seasonal. Uh, and as a Scott wrote, um, running before the wind, its speed was proverbial, probably 12 to 15 knots to a uh, galleon's five or six. Uh, but it um, performed poorly in rough uh, water in even a quartering wind. Um, so Filipino boats, I forget about one thing, um, this is Garay, this is another also Filipino boat um, with the same construction, uh, with the same uh, techniques um, and more of um, components about which I uh, said already um, are repeating uh, and in the bottom you can see um, how the deck looks like. Um, it was made of uh, bamboo or palm wood um, and was cut into the, some kind of sections. Uh, so we can guess that the deck also was a uh, light component uh, of the uh, hull. So Filipino boats were developed um, were developed uh, to sail on a local coastal waters, uh, not to sail on a deep sea. Um, so the light construction, lack of, lack of the real keel, uh, center, uh, lack of the center ruder or center or uh, lee boards, um, caused that the boat could be easily blow sideways. Um, and here I show you uh, the description um, of the um, local boats, um, generally um, Francisco Ignacio de Alcina, he was um, well known um, Jesuit, uh, Spanish Jesuit. Um, and he described um, how fast um, local boats could be. Um, and ad one uh, other thing uh, in this um, fragment is important uh, about the Alcina mention, um, that Spanish Spaniards uh, really quickly started using uh, local boats um, because when uh, in 1565 uh, Spaniards started the conquest of the islands, um, they quickly realized um, that the environment uh, and geography of the, of the archipelago um, are a, some kind of a ban uh, for uh, Spanish uh, galleons. Mm. But it's, it not, it's not only a one example um, of, uh, that prove that um, Spaniards uh, were using uh, Filipino boats uh, during their conquest, uh, because as we know, um, other local boats as Biroco um, formed part of Spanish uh, fleet.
So thank you for your attention. I try to run through this uh, presentation very quickly. Uh, as I said, uh, th this topic is very complex, so it's hard to explain everything in 20 minutes. So thank you very much. I think you succeeded in <laughs> making us interested in this, in this topic. Um, now we're coming back from uh, far Pacific uh, part uh, here to our homeland. And uh, now we will have presentation about uh, Vistula shipwrecks, the hunt for Vistula wrecks. And um, the presenter is uh, Piotr Price from Institute of Archaeology and Ethnology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Hello everyone, I'm very glad that I can tell you something about our project uh, for the hunt for the wrecks. And in the year uh, 2090 and 2020, the Association of Archaeology of Tomorrow, uh, with the support of Institute of Archaeology of the University of Warsaw, carried out the research project uh, involving um, the location, location and inventory of underwater archaeology site uh, in the water of Vistula River. And the main participant of that was this pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Andrzej Szerszeń, Artur Brzuska, and me, Piotr Preis. But let's start from the Vistula, because Vistula is uh, our largest river in Poland, which most of the land uh, of our country has access for hundreds of years. Uh, it was my uh, communication artery through which uh, countless of uh, amounts of gods were transported. It was mainly grain, wood, and agricultural product. During the Middle Age, the importance of this tular trade route increased, reaching the apogeum of goods traffic between 16th and 19th centuries. At its peak time, uh, its flow uh, from 1,000 to even 2,000 uh, big wooden ship every year. And our research area was concentrated in two uh, squares. First, uh, from Świętokrzyski Bridge to uh, Jabłonna City. And it was uh, conducted in uh, 2019. The research was uh, co-financed with Ministry of Culture and National Heritage as a part of protection of Archaeological Monument 2019 edition program, which a year later uh, we were financing from our own funds. Uh, and in the beginning, I just want to say a few words about the type of the wooden boat uh, who was uh, sailing uh, in our river. It's, it's just, there are plenty of more of them, but it's just general idea. We can divide them, uh, uh, Vistula flat, in two main categories. The first one, a swim with the river flow. Uh, this are a quite simple unit, easy to build, and uh, they were dismantled after they reached their destination, and the wood from them was sold to increase the earning for the, for the trip. They were made, uh, managed by a few people, used the oars to steer the ship course. Uh, the simplest of them are ordinary rafts, uh, then Komiegi, Galare, and Beki were a bit more uh, advanced than rafts. And another type of uh, ships were equipped with uh, the mast and the sail. Uh, and it's referred with Koza, Dubase, and Szkuty. That's all Polish names. So <laughs> uh, they mainly different in, in size. Uh, the Szkuty was the biggest one. Uh, which were up to 40 meters uh, long and 6 meters wide. They were serviced by about uh, 20 people and they could carry uh, uh, up to 100 tons of goods. So they are pretty big ships, river ships. And um, our penetration section of the Vistula, we use a non-invasive uh, invasive method uh, consisting of use of the side sonar. 
It was placed on a four meter uh, inflatable boat with a 15 uh, horsepower engine, which thanks to its small draft uh, allowed us to penetrate even very shallow water, like in this picture, which is, you can stand there. Uh, anterior process was recorded and an ongoing uh, basis using GPS with the track uh, recording. The recorded GPS track and sonar image were correlated with each other and placed on the plans. Uh, additional uh, to that, uh, we create a bathymetric plan. And uh, yeah, there's the fragment of the bathymetric plan and also the photogram uh, mosaic of the, of the uh, seabed. And the uh, uh, sites interpreted as suspicious uh, a diver was sent to investigate. And I must say, uh, we see some nice picture from, from ar all around the world already, but uh, diving in Vistula, it's not like that. Uh, the visibility is very poor. It's, it's uh, around 20, maybe 30 centimeters. Uh, we have the current, so it's like four to six uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, there is a lot of obstacle down there, like uh, tree trunks, stones, Etc. Uh, so you should properly prepare your dive site. That is, uh, swim out of the wreck, put a buoy, release the safety line, and only in that such condition, uh, and diver can start to work. And he move uh, will be attached to a rope, which he can pull himself uh, up against the currents, or lower himself downstream. In such condition, the diver must rely uh, of examining the object uh, mostly by hand uh, and uh, taking measurements of structural element. Uh, that's determining what object he is dealing with. With, with some cases, it was hard to tell if you're touching a wood or uh, steel or, I don't know, fridge, for example, because we also found the fridge and some beds <laughs> down there. But what we find, what lies below? Well, uh, we find a lot of uh, modern objects. Uh, that's, for example, is uh, part of the dragger, uh, which, we, which we find. And here, for example, is a wreck of a small motorboat, four meters long. And here, if it starts, it will be moving, and you can see uh, the visibility down there. Look like this. <laughs> That's we see the steering wheel of the motorboat. And if you wonder, we used the uh, inspection of that kind of, of object, very sophisticated uh, tool, a uh, broomstick with the camera attached to that. <laughs> uh, we also find a pretty large steel bark, so it's 12 meter long, uh, but it's made from steel, so it's quite modern, 20 centuries. Uh, we also find a remain of a bridge from Second World War, we didn't know before that, so it's also Nice finding. Uh, of course, we have a lot of problem with the interpretation of the image from the sonar because uh, the bottom of the river is, is um, there is a, a plenty of, of uh, different kind of objects like, like I tell you before, the tree trunks, uh, natural shallows, big rocks, uh, stuff like this. And so we spent a lot of time to just analyzing the, uh, the image and try to, to see something interesting for us. Uh, we also find some wooden big ship. For example, uh, this is a uh, wreck uh, approximately 20 meter long and six meter wide, uh, with, si with one side completely preserved. The ship is building on a square plan, which may suggest that it serves as a ferry. The exposed side shows steel structure 
elements that could have been used to support uh, the rope supporting the crossing of the ferry across the river. For that reason, it seems reasonable to assume that uh, this craft was made in uh, 19th century on, on first half of 20th centuries, century. And that's an uh, example of a picture taken in Warsaw in, uh, between the year 1918 and 1939. And in the back, we see that kind of ferry, wooden ferry. Uh, it's also similar to different kinds of the craft, of galars. We have a uh, sample of, of them here. Uh, it's also from Warsaw, and the picture is from 1977. Another wreck was located uh, at the level of Rusauka Beach close to the right bank of the river. The vessel is placed perpendicular to the shore, uh, being partially buried by the uh, bottom sediment. The visibi uh, visible part of the, of the wreck is about 10 meters long and 5 meters wide. Uh, and the analysis of the sonar uh, and our diving on, on that object um, uh, uh, we, we assume we know, now we know that the uh, next several meter of the of the wreck is in the bottom of the of the river uh, in uh, september 2019 a bottom flight was uh, floor was uh, detached from the wreck uh, and we have uh, been called to security it's about three and a half meter long uh, and the structure of the frame indicated uh, that the plating strip was mounted with overlap and it was pretty massive. We, we needed five people just to move it uh, from the shore. And we also take a photograph and take a photogrammetric documentation, uh, which allow us to generate a three-dimension object of that artifact. And we take a sample for C14 dating, uh, which we allow to dating the wreck of the middle of 18th centuries. Uh, thanks to the publicity of our previous finds, the local media is eager to share, uh, community is eager to share uh, new information with us. Using the social media, we received information about fragments of the ship site, which was located in the, on the Praga side of Warsaw, between the Gdańsk Bridge and the Rusauka Bridge. Uh, so we make a sonar reconnaissance of that place, and we uh, reveal the wreck of the sunken vessel. The location of the wreck is difficult to assess because it's uh, between two uh, breakwaters, so our uh, um, vessel cannot uh, swim there in uh, proper uh, direction, so the um, image from the sonar is in best quality. However, uh, based on the data obtained, it can be concluded that the visible flag fragment of, the, of this ship is six and a half meter long and three and 0.5 meter wide and the rest of the wreck is hidden under the, the bed of the river. And the reconstruction of the previous site indicated that the, that could be that the, could be ship around 12 meter long. Uh, so perhaps we have dealing with the bath tip of the boat. That should be another film. Yeah, and we also find something like this. It was pretty surprised. find that large wreck. So it's wooden ship, it's uh, 37 meter long with uh, six and a half meter wide. Uh, the wreck is located 15 meters from the left bank of the river uh, at the level of uh, Womianki Dolne. The vessel is light uh, along the shore, partially covered by mud and sand. The bottom part has been preserved together with the first and sometimes the second side of the side plating. Analysis of the remains and comparison of the wreck of the ship from Chersk allow us to assume and uh, that could be a wreck of the Skuta. Uh, that's uh, with comparison, that, that's our boat and the wreck, so it's massive. <laughs> and we also know about the, the scooter construction from iconography, example, like this. 
and this we have see here a couple of, of uh, scooter with fault mast but still it's it's ship um, and type of scooter and uh, we, we also now have one of, of that kind of wreck uh, discovered and excavated in Chersk and uh, again you can see that it is pretty massive construction and we also um, find uh, stuff just to swim in the river uh, because they are just si uh, s s sitting from from the water uh, like uh, part of the of the boat like anchors and uh, of course we, we document all the, all of them and put it on the plan uh, but all of them was was modern uh, so in conclusion uh, we uh, managed to search about 20 kilometers of river and we, we find uh, 70 different objects which of them four of them was uh, wooden shipwreck uh, so uh, the potential of, of um, this kind of work I think is, is quite great and uh, no one before managed to do something like in Poland on that big scale, like 20 kilometers. Uh, so that's our all research team, and I thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Piotr, for your uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Price. <laughs> And uh, um, let me open the discussion. And uh, let me begin with uh, my question to you. And I'm interested in uh, the Shkuta that you mentioned, the one that is from uh, Womianki, yeah. uh, the largest one that you showed us. And um, I have two questions. First is, uh, do you have any dating? Do you know how old it is? And my second question is about the cargo. As you uh, probably remember, we were uh, looking for uh, mainly yeah, cargo of the ships from the 17th century. So here I'm interested if you found any cargo. Yeah, so uh, about the cargo. Uh, no, we don't find any cargo. It's, uh, there is a lot of trash there. So maybe there is something if you make a proper um, excavation. Maybe you can find something, but uh, in, uh, in our prospection we don't find any cargo. And uh, same uh, about the dating. We, that, that was on the pro, um, uh, first look on, on the wreck. We don't have permission to take the sample for dating. I hope we manage to do it in, in uh, this year, uh, but uh, the pandemic and stuff like this just delay us, our work. So we don't have any date for now. Okay, good luck. Um, please join us with the discussion, uh, some more questions. Yes. Uh, maybe start with the last paper. Uh, I have more technical questions. Uh, how difficult was to obtain the permission from the river authorities to operate on the river? Because from my own experience, I know they are not very understandable for archaeologists. And the second question is how the heritage uh, institution reacted on the reported results because it might be also interesting. I think about the difficult to obtain the paper. I think that Arthur could answer to that because the, he managed to obtain all the papers. I give the, the speaker for him. Uh, but the second, uh, yeah, we was on TV, for example. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for now, <laughs> at least. And I give it uh, Arthur. Arthur! <laughs> Arthur! <laughs> so, if you don't want, okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, uh, it was difficult. We, we, we managed uh, to acquire all the pepper in Ireland. Uh, four months, <laughs> uh, just to struggle to, to, to collect all, all the necessary permission and, and stuff like this. So yeah, it's it's time-consuming project. <laughs> okay. I will use the 
chance. Uh, I will have the question about the Filipino boats. I mean, first of all, I, it was great paper. I really enjoy it. Um, but I have two questions. Maybe I didn't listen to carefully because um, the, you, ha, you, you show very nice pictures, quite a lot of reconstructions. Are they based on ethnography or, on, or they based on archaeology? And maybe I will ask the second question uh, because you mentioned about the, the lash boats and the uh, shell first construction, uh, which is really great. Uh, but first of all, did you notice there are some transition boats which use both techniques? And also, did you notice there's any speciality? So for example, the, for the large cargo, it will be lash boat or shell boats. I mean, any sort of specialization in that uh, use techniques. So pl please join us here. Um, so just um, could you repeat the first uh, <laughs> question? I'm sorry. The first question was, did you more based on ethnographic ah. resources or on archaeological sources? Um, it depends. Some. Um, some schemes which I uh, which I present, uh, and it was uh, described uh, on the um, presentation. Um, they were they were based on a Butuan boat site, uh, but for uh, for example, um, the scheme uh, which um, was showed by S uh, Scott um, probably it's just. Um, mm, the hypothesis, it's in the way of the hypothesis, how, um, how it could look like. And you had the second uh, question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, well, maybe the, the shorter one. Did you ever went across a boat which was built in like two, two techniques or mixed techniques? Um, some researchers uh, believe that um, in the beginning uh, the um, hull was built in a um, shell first technique uh, with, um, te with um, joining planks by sewing, as I said. It was a s special way of sewing in Southeast Asia. Um, but then uh, probably um, some uh, techniques were connected uh, and appeared uh, in the same for in, in the same example I mean um, where uh, in the um, hull was used uh, um, sewing uh, technique uh, of joining plan planks but also they used uh, in the same um, example um, edge pack technique and um, it is said that uh, the last phase of uh, this um, construction of a local boat in, in Philippines but also in the Southeast Asia was uh, the edge pack technique. Um, it was more popular um, in a modern uh, time. We have a question here in the front. Uh, I have also the question uh, concerning the, the, the your speech. So um, uh, I would like uh, to notice, first of all, that uh, it came to my mind that, uh, that the techniques are narrow, actually. The, 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 the number is narrow, so we have a lot of parallels to different periods and different areas, uh, like uh, Motis and Tenon, which is known from Mediterranean, like elastic ribs uh, known from Massaron. Uh, we presented, we had the opportunity to look at this yesterday, but also in the Bronze Age and European Nordic uh, zone, there are uh, um, boats done like that. Or, so a lot of the lugs, which has parallels in uh, Nordic uh, uh, boat building as well. But uh, so that's, that's uh, of course, uh, let's say, uh, astonishing for me. Uh, but uh, I'd like to ask uh, about some geographical 
um, uh, influence, uh, the influence of ge geography. Uh, you told us uh, that there are a lot of uh, constru constructional elements which are connected with uh, uh, waging the war on the uh, sea, uh, on, the on those boats. Uh, and uh, as opposed to the um, European uh, boat building, it is not like that. So maybe it is connected with geography. So was it an, uh, enough place to wage the war on those small islands? Uh, if not, maybe they try to do it on boat. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, of course, just, just the, my, my uh, assumption. So, so could it be that, uh, that was, was it enough place to, uh, to uh, do the war, to wage the war on those small islands or not? I'm not sure, uh, am I um, understand well Okay, the my question, question is uh, whether, because there's a great difference mm -hmm. between uh, European boat building and, and uh, Southeast Asian, uh, let's say, uh, one. Uh, because in Europe, those boats and ships, especially boats, uh, 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 even similar, they were not used for uh, for uh, waging the war. They were just transporting vessels. Uh, they transport warriors, but not, not mm -hmm. uh, the war was not uh, situated on, on the sea. And here it was. So uh, whether the, the, the question is whether the difference lies in the fact that there was no enough space to wage the war, to battle, to, to um, do the battles, uh, to uh, situate them uh, on the land. Because, I don't know, maybe it was too narrow, uh, because it was uh, not flat, there were no flat areas to, to wage uh, war. Maybe, I don't know, uh, because of, of uh, rocky uh, terrain, uneven. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. um, it's, hard, it's hard to exp um, Mm, say something about it. Uh, we have not enough information, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but generally, um, the um, tradition of uh, Filipino, um, because um, mm, I described the area, the, the archipelago, as the Philippines, but in the past, um, it wasn't a one country. Uh, so, um, groups, uh, et ethnographical groups uh, of, let's say, today Filipinos, were fighting um, between themselves. So, I guess um, battles. Mostly on the sea or also on the land? Uh, on land? Uh, mostly on the sea that they fought, yeah. or also on the land, or both? Um, I guess both, uh, because. Um, Okay, uh, uh, the, t the truth is I uh, present only the most representative boats uh, for the Philippines um, traditions, um, but they had um, much more types of wood, smaller um, vessels. So um, it was described uh, in some um, resources um, that um, Smaller boats uh, were sailing with uh, bigger uh, vessels, like with Caracoa. Um, so Caracoa was exactly uh, used for battles uh, by ship to ship, uh, but um, they had also smaller vessels, uh, which allows to some part, uh, some group of uh, warriors um, transport uh, them to the land. So it's hard to say uh, what kind of battles uh, um, they, to they prefer. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I think what um, Professor Kantner asked uh, could be a good starting point for for expanding uh, this, this paper into uh, something bigger, like including uh, the specific of the warfare in the Philippines region and uh, strategy and tactics, like military tactics, that could maybe somehow um, 
help us to understand why such uh, shipbuilding uh, methods were used by, uh, by the local shipbuilders. But this is very interesting, and I think it's very, very promising, very, uh, yeah, very interesting area. Um, yes, any more questions? Yes, we have two questions in the, in the back of the room. Thank you. I have a question about the, the Dutch project, the Zoe cleanup. Uh, really interesting stuff. I was just thinking, when you started this project, right, you, you most probably you had a lot of uh, multi-beam images to be analyzed, right, to distinguish the, say, the, the trash coming from Zoe from non-trash or another trash, right? How did you do that? How did you approach this problem? And did you analyze the data or the information like manually, or there was some, some hub you used from, from computers, artificial intelligence, whatsoever? Now we had a, a team of about 10 uh, people processing day and night for four months. So they went through all the raw data and were just marking everything they thought that was debris from the containers. Then everything went to me and my team, the archaeological team, and we went through all the images again to say whether this is a shipwreck or not. So it's all manually done, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had another question. There. Yes, actually, it's related to the copper plate wreck. Um, I have two questions. So uh, when you found this container in relation to the wreck, in terms of ocean jurisdiction, where did it lie? If it was in territorial waters or not? And if you can answer that, if not, no worries. Um, and the second question, um, coming from a seafaring background, this. Um, container incident is the biggest nightmare that can happen at sea. Um, so my question to you is how compliant are commercial ships when it comes to discoveries that are uh, behind the scenes, if you know what I mean? Because this happened because of the incident that happened publicly. So yeah, as a seafarer, I have my own gossip. I'm not gonna tell secrets right now, but I do, so I'd like to, your opinion on that. Well, about your first question, jurisdiction, um, most of the parts were in Dutch waters and within the 12 mile zone, so uh, that was a problem for the Dutch government, but uh, a lot of debris was in the German area and well, there was a stick border between Germany and Holland, so the Germans did their own cleanup and we did ours, but the, the survey was uh, uh, done together. So Germany and Holland performed the survey together. And now your second question, um, can, you, can you repeat it just? Yes, uh, how compliant are commercial ships which relates to such fines? Well, normally actually they're not, as you stated before, but in this case they couldn't uh, uh, ignore it because it was all on the news and it was and uh, in the end they turn it into a, a, a good story a nice story so they said to themselves well look what we did we saved uh, archaeological uh, uh, material but normally this is not uh, not the case so if you look at the dredging companies they just ignore it and they will never report it Okay, do we have more? Yes, we have one question from the back of the room. Yeah, uh, regarding the copper plate wreck, uh, did you find any other cargo than just the copper? Some barrels, wood, anything else? No, not much other uh, objects. Uh, we have some things which are uh, concretion, concretions, so they still have to be opened and still have to be x-rayed. But no, uh, except for the cannonballs and small cannon and the copper, of course, no other finds, no, nothing whatsoever. Uh, no, any pottery? No pottery, nothing, no. Um, any more questions? Yes, we have one. <laughs> uh, it's quite technical. Uh, you so briefly, uh, picture from a parametric sub-bottom profiler. I guess it was done either by Inomar or Inomar technology. Uh, 
I mean, because we use them as well, and we have, I mean, it works perfect, uh, and they help us a lot, but then we have a lot of problem with the software. Uh, we use the medical software uh, to interpret the data, the, but, I mean, how do you deal it with this problem? Well, we use the, uh, the Inoma software itself, so the SES 2000, it's called, I think, the, the software, and, uh, yeah. It works, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's workable for us. So, um, yeah, we, we have other software, uh, but then you are talking about very expensive software, the professional uh, from the oil industry. But for this case, it worked fine. Uh, the only problem was that the sub-bottom profiling, uh, the parametric echosounder doesn't work in all areas very good. Eh? So if you have a very sandy bottom like here, well the penetration is not much. So if you have a nice soft uh, sediments, then you have a lot of penetration and a lot of detail. But it's still geophysical uh, research. It's still uh, yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah, but you know. Yeah. Um, do we have more questions? Um, I have one more question uh, related to um, shipwrecks from uh, Vistula River. I would like to ask about uh, the sonars. I mean, what was um, the efficiency of uh, use of this tool? I mean, how shallow water could be uh, for you to operate with the, with the sonar? So, uh, managed to obtain the picture from, well, one meter, sometimes in, in best condition, half meter, but mostly one meter, that's the optimum. So it's, so it's pretty shallow, so you had access to the shallowest parts of the river too? Yeah, that, that, that was the plan, that's, that's why we use that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have some more? Yes, we have one more question. Um, Piotr, next to you. I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, but my question is directed to Enrique. Um, I really like your project. I think it's the way forward. And it's very impressive on what scale you did it. Um, my question to you is that you touched the subject of looting. And coming from an island state, that is the thing. Yeah. Um, did you come across, uh, especially when you worked with children, that children tend to become naive and say, oh, my grandfather or someone has something from the sea which might relate to that ship? If you had this situation, how did you deal with that? Or if you know someone who have something related to the ship, how do you deal with the situation? Thank you for the question. Actually, we have those kind of situations in some of the workshops we, uh, we did with uh, schools, like the, the actual fact is like not from kids mm -hmm. to get that relation, but the parents sometimes are there present bringing the kids to the workshop and they are the, the first one that coming after the, the experience and talking to you like, oh, you know, I got this, I got that, I got that, that since we are starting we actually were able to start a communication with the local authorities and what is happening is naturally mostly now um, the calling the local authorities to say like to asking some of the parents not everyone you know like uh, to build trust is very hard in this context but after five years working in there uh, some of the parents just went to the local authorities to ask information about, okay, what I should do with this, I don't want to travel, I don't know. Uh, there is other, another situation with the um, uh, trolling fishing in the island, which is a very strong uh, problem uh, currently. We're dealing with that also from educational side. Um, and yeah, like at least this kind of, of experience what it's giving us is a different channel of communication. Yes, taking apart, afraid, <laughs> like the fear for some of the sailors to speak or when they realize this could be a beneficial for, for the future or even trolling fisher, uh, fishermen, they starting to have a new 
uh, channel for conversation to propose actions or new ways to develop uh, a new solution for this, this kind of problem. So yeah, I think it's very beneficial. Yeah. Yes, some more questions. Okay, so we don't have more questions. Um, in a couple of minutes, we are sti starting our uh, poster session. We have four wonderful posters here um, about um, sonar imaging, about uh, wrecks uh, in lower order, about uh, more than 100 wrecks um, also in lower order um, area, and we have a review of scientific activities of the Student Association for Underwater Archaeology of uh, University of Warsaw. And uh, it um, starts at half past one, which is... One more poster, a bit more from the expedition to Guatemala and Margarita Challenge, which could be more for the expedition. So we have five posters. Um, so I uh, really invite you to um, read them and um, uh, talk to uh, the researchers. And um, last uh, notice, uh, we have 10 past two. We are meeting for the lunch. We are meeting downstairs here on this side of the, uh, like on the courtyard of the university, uh, at the exit to the, to the courtyard, not to the uh, main street. 10 past two. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third session. Uh, today I have a great honor to be a chair of this session, which is very close to my heart. Uh, the name of the session is On the Borderline, Waterfront Archaeology Worldwide. And today I would like to take you for the, I hope, fascinating trip through the seas and oceans. Let's start from the beautiful Sicily with the fishermen. We will sail to the Arabian Gulf, to the Kuwait Gulf and small Failaka Island. And from Failaka Island, let's go further to the Rapa Nui. In a, uh, <clears throat> and from Rapa Nui, we will go back to the ancient Greek harbor. Let's, the, first, uh, the first speech is uh, fishing rituality in Sicily from prehistory to modern age. Uh, I would like to invite to our table uh, Concetta Caruso, uh, Giulia Raimondi, and Fabio Fancello. Welcome. Take care. The, the floor is yours. So, thank you. Fabio is not here, but uh, we all. I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you, uh, the staff and the organization. Uh, maybe it's. No, okay, thank you. Um, so I was here for the second World Song Seminar and I'm glad to be here again. And uh, so um, our topic is a real important topic for us and for Sicily because <clears throat> in the last years we are uh, doing a revaluation of some important uh, things connect in connection, they are putting in connection landscape and the rituality and the economy and the ancient sources literary sources, iconographic sources. So we are starting now with this research with the help of our university and our CNR, our council, the National Council of the Research. And uh, now I think that Concetta will start with, uh, uh, with the prehistory and after I will say something about the classical age. Thank you. So we talk about Sicily, the rituality, and the action of fishing across the time. Since the Neolithic age, around 8,000, 6,000 before Christ, there are numerous evidence of the great importance of the sea as a basin for mankind. One example is the presence of the shellfish inside the archaeological strata of the Pleistocene time into the Sicilian caves situated near the coasts. From this period, fish became a really important activity for the diversification of human nutrition, especially for the Mediterranean people. But we know, as Brodel reminds, that this sea is dangerous with storm sadness. For this reason, the fish were caught near the coast, close to the docks, to allow the fishmen a quick return on land in case of storm. Fish, and tuna in particular, is often present in ancient literature in a rather transversal way. In scientific and taxonomic texts, such as in Aristoteles' History of Animals, in Strabo's Geography, in Pausanias, Plutarch, Polybius' work, and, of course, in Plinio el Vecchio, Naturalis Historia. Aesop makes him the spokesman for moral notion and proverbs. The capture technique was used as a similitude of war stories, um, uh, war stories and uh, also or a paradigm of uh, um, entrapping, as in, uh, it happened in Aeschylus Persian about the Salaminas battle. The slaughter of the sweet horse described in the Odyssey can be compared to the tuna slaughter, and also we have some description in Herodotus stories. And also, uh, obviously, is um, in gastronomic text, 
uh, there are many information about the way of presentation uh, of um, preparing tuna. But in Sicily, along the northwest coast of uh, Sicily and north, in front of the picturesque city of Trapani, there are the Egadian Island. Among them, the smallest is Levanso, characterized by a series of caves along the coast. The most famous of these is the Grotta del Genovese. It is a, a limestone cave with artistic decoration of the Sicilian prehistory, discovered in 1949 by Fl Florence foreign painter Francesca Minel Minellono. It consists of two artistically and chronological distinct uh, cycles inside a low, inside a low and long uh, internal room called the Retro Grotta. This structure has uh, certainly influenced the preservation of the two decorative cycles. The most ancient are the signs engraved during the Upper Paleolithic Epigravetian. The second one is more recent, dated between the final Neolithic and the Neolithic age, when the sea had risen, causing the separation from Sicily. This cycle is composed of figures painted in black and one in red. There are human figures, both male and female. Uh, we have also animals, both terrestrial, that marine, and uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, signs uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, in what uh, to the human eye uh, is presented as the first prize without a dub, there are a dolphin and a tuna, marine animals of the area. Uh, together at these uh, two marine animals, there are, uh, about, uh, there are also about 20 black pigeons, pigs, little idols, dogs, and uh, bovin, anthropomorphic pigeons, and other heavy label signs. In a beautiful palimpsest, thanks to the chromatic game that occurs between the light color of the rock and the black intensive painting. The, the second group uh, is uh, in the center of the cave, in which are some anthropomorphic figures, with the bigger one accompanied with what appears to be a dog, and perhaps a small fish among dogs in of idol, like, uh, no, cosa era questo, forse. So we, we can see in the slide. And uh, um, third and final group uh, is stream on the sailing with, uh, with uh, anthropomorphic and other size element. No, sorry. <laughs> Professor Paolo Graziosi of the Institute of Human Paleoanthropological of the University of Florence identified five categories of subject, anthropomorphic, quadrupers, fish fauna, geographic, um, geometric body idols, and identify, unidentified features. The presence of bigger fish is not something surprising because they are typical of local fauna to this, today, to this day. But uncertain and unknown remain the techniques relating to their capture. Even assuming the use of nets, the capture of tuna requires speci specific biological and technology knowledge with a complex role sharing uh, organization. The pictural complex on the Grotta del Genovese has undoubtedly a cultural value of a shamanic um, ceremony. It is a, a complex of a world in change in which mankind increasingly sedentary and the craftsman of nature begins to be the architect of his own fate. 
At the same time, language and communication became the cornerstone of the transmission of knowledge and much more complex practice uh, than hunting. In this trip between the Neolithic to the Eneolithic age, the graphic sign acquired the function of symbol, and sign that encloses a complex concept. So we go the fishing during the classic age. Okay. So if for the prehistory we are um, we are tracing, we are. Um, uh, probably um, doing uh, something for underline how the uh, religious and the religiosity is connected to the fishing and uh, to the uh, tuna fishing. Uh, for, the, for the classical age, we have more attestation and more uh, sources. So uh, I want to just show to you um, an iconography, and uh, I'm referring, okay, <laughs> to this one. And because it's a, a Sicily Oud crater from um, our museum near Palermo. So we are talking about the Western Sicily. Uh, and we could keep talking about the tuna fishing in our island by examining this well known crater uh, dated to the 4th century BC. And this sign is, represent, uh, is representing a caricatural sign and two caricatural, caricatural characters, uh, a seller, a buyer, uh, two tuna, and some objects. That, um, and they um, are uh, uh, ritual and uh, connected to other attestation of this iconography, because this is a makaira, and the makaira is um, a, a knife, a big knife uh, for the, um, big fish like tuna and the swordfish, and we have some attestation, but uh, due to the pandemic situation, it's really difficult to, to uh, have the access, the access to the um, superintendency and to sub, some museum. Uh, so we are showing to you only just the, the vase and the, um, the ceramic iconography. Uh, so the seller shirtless has already chopped the head of the first tuna off and place it on the kyanka, this kind of uh, three foot log used for this purpose. And he used a sort of clever, the makaira, to behave it. On the ground, there is the other tuna, and we, which is waiting to be butchered, of course. And the buyer covered in a sort of clock holds a coin in his hand here. The grotesque aspect of these characters leads us to imagine an argument about the quality of the product uh, that the buyer wants to purchase and seller wants to trade. But uh, caricatural aspects uh, and characteristic apart, the, sign, the, the scene still makes us think, to, um, think of a costume on fishing and trade and consumption of tuna in Sicily and in, in the Mediterranean basin. So, just... So the tuna comes in earth from the Atlantic, crossing to the Strait of Gibraltar, and it moves all over the Mediterranean. Uh, you are watching uh, the island of Mozia, because we have a lot of attestation in Mozia, uh, where there is the mission of La Sapienza in Rome University. Um, so uh, they basically move all over the Mediterranean and touching all coasts from Africa to Sardinia, uh, from Spain to France, but most of it comes to Sicily because of the central position of the island in the Mediterranean. Tuna touching the Sicilian coast, and we can say that they make the same journey of the Phoenician undertook by the sea, starting instead from the east to the west. We also must consider that Phoenician painted a big eye on their ship, and hypothetically, yeah, as an, um, an apotropaic symbol uh, related to fishing, and that they also imprinted to the fish on their coins. Other studies say that the um, big eye is uh, of the deity. But uh, we can see that sometimes uh, um, the deities and the, um, uh, the, the fishing, cons they are, there, there are a lot of connection, and we will see in the part of the documentary uh, that will show after this part. 
So uh, this evidence leads us to, to suppose that the Punic merchants were the first to set up a system of nets, uh, which could be um, the tuna fishing net system in those areas of the island visited by them around Mozia. <clears throat> in Sicily, uh, there has always been evidence of the passage of tuna from Capo Lilibeo, from Capo Lilibeo and uh, through the Egadian Islands and the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, touching Capo Peloro near Messina, uh, crossing the Strait of Messina and reaching to Capo Passero in the lower part of the island. During its Mediterranean migration, however, it seems that the journey made by uh, the tuna uh, take place on board for the laying of the eggs between uh, uh, Messina in uh, Capo Peloro and um, uh, between Messina and Trapani, basically, so uh, between uh, Capo Lilibeo here and Capo Peloro here. So the return marks the depletion of its genetic function. But, uh, we could distinguish two fishing methods in uh, this attestation as we have in Sicily. Um, here you are watching the tonnara, um, the, the plants, the salt, um, salting plants um, for, of uh, Vendicari in Sicily, and here the, um, in Marsala, the same in Marsala, this is Erice. Um, so we could distinguish two fishing methods, the first one managed with a surrounding net and the second one with a fixed fishing net. The first one was suitable for fish belonging to the tuna family, but probably um, of a smaller size, as Claudio Leano recounts, because we are using a lot of classical sources in this case. The second one is depicted by Oppiano. In both cases, fishermen relied uh, on tinoscopos, tunoscopos in Greek, the sighter, whose role was essential for the success of fishing. In the first case, the tunoscopos skill was to establish the exact moment when the nets could descend on what appeared a real herd. In the second one, the skill was in order given to the fishermen to close the doors of the trap once the fish had entered. As already mentioned, and source help to comprehend the Sicily had a lot of tuna fishing and processing facilities, but being the tuna seasonal product, it is, believing, it is believed that during uh, the year, the facilities were used for processing uh, other kind of fishes, maybe uh, of a smaller size. Um, the big fish had a higher cost than the others uh, as they need a series of specific deeds, the boats, the sighting, the fishing technique, the transport to shore, the quartering, the salting, the distribution. For this reason, uh, real fishing enterprises were born. So the findings of tuna remains are rare, are rare and this seems strange given the widespread of consumption. This is the project uh, led by the University of Catania in Cadiz and uh, also from the CNR, as I say. And uh, thanks for the Professor Malfitano for uh, the, the pictures. And uh, I um, believe that it's important to follow also these accounts for, um, because they are doing a great uh, communication of the project. And uh, however, it's, it's, it is not surprising thing that just for its size, the product could be easily cleaned from the bones. So we are not finding a lot of this one because uh, then they eliminate the remains or they use it as fertilization. Uh, but if you will visit this page, you will see also that they found uh, in this season, in uh, September, a lot of uh, bones, for, um, uh, tuna bones. So right in Portopalo, here it's Portopalo, Scalomandria, uh, in front of the island of Capo Passero that we saw before, came to light uh, a structure for the fish conservation formed by a group of 50 square and round tank, but now are 60, more than 60. And um, uh, behind these tanks, a paved courtyard could have been used for the slaughter and the bones removal as the bones remains show. The Hellenistic structure also has a small oven and a small tank used for wraps for the collection of liquids and particularly for the collection of the blood of the tuna. And the findings suggest that the structure was used uh, from the Hellenistic to the Republi uh, Republic and Imperial Age, Roman Age. 
Another structure excavated in the 90s is located about 20 kilometers from Porto Palo, is Vendigri, but you will read about this on the publication, I think, because of the time. Uh, so the tuna uh, fishing structures and the tuna fishing establishment, because of the characteristic of the type of fishing uh, implicated, was a place of socialization and uh, also seasonal uh, for people who worked together. It's okay. <laughs> who worked together. And uh, when the times were not good for fishing, uh, this place could be abandoned uh, if not exploited for anything else. We have a station and structure also in Tindari, uh, in Cefalu, uh, San Vitolo Capo, so in all the part of the Sicily that we saw before. And uh, another big structure is in Pachino, and other areas also of Sicily. And there are remains that indicate settlements of tuna fishing establishment in these places, but in this context, it was chosen to discuss only of these. Uh, the places described they were used and reused also um, after a long period of inactivity, also in the Arab uh, era in Sicily, uh, after the Arab invasion. Uh, the number of the tuna fishing establishment gradually increased in the, in, this, in the time. At the end of the 19th century and beyond, there were about 80 nearly all in function. But now I think that Concetta will say. And so we, uh, we can see the fishing during the modern age uh, by uh, Vittorio De Seta, the director, one of the father of the Italian anthropological documentary, has dwelled on the relationship between men and fishing in the modern age also. His work is called Cycle of the Lost World, with the story of ten dwells on the rigorous organization of rules and on the reception of rituals led by fishermen, rituals that seems a primordial reflex. Filmed in 1954, Lu Tempo di Lupisci Spada, The Time of Swordfish, is a documentary on traditional swordfish fishing which correspond a specific ritual, the origin on which are lost in time. Quickly, the silence of the horse is interrupted by the um, screens of uh, the watchman, or the so-called tunoscopos, uh, who saw the swordfish not far away. Once the hint has started, the sun watchman gives order while continuing to follow with his eyes where the fish is going, uh, calculate its movement according to the current and uh, the light. In the meantime, the spear is prepared uh, on the bow and once the prey is on sight, it is launched, eating uh, its target. And uh, now we can see uh, um, a short clip about that realized by Fabio Fancello. <laughs> So, in Contadini del Mare, Farmers of the Sea, the Seta, tells another ritual, the tuna fishing, which for millennia has followed the same route. 
The wedding begins with the some songs, but it becomes more and more silent. The images are like oil painted, while the sound is covered by the waves. The second moment is the slaughter. There are very fast sequences in which the man's rhythmic scripts go to cover the sound of the sea. Out of respect for the feeding animal and a sign of gratitude toward God, farmer, fishermen uh, take off their hats and the ritual is over, and uh, as we'll see in the last clip. <laughs> It's important to underline that uh, there is a continuity from the prehistoric times because there are the same images of this video in the <coughs> cave of the Genovese. Uh, but uh, we have some restriction we, for the photos because inside the cave we can't do, take picture from 20 years, something like that. Yeah. So <laughs> we have just uh, the, um, the first uh, the first graffiti and uh, frescoes that you saw. And uh, it's important also that uh, now in Nacitressa, near Catania, there is a f festival, uh, the um, Swordfish Festival. And uh, it's uh, really, really, really uh, similar uh, or, um, with the classical source that um, we can yeah, read, really Claudio, um, Claudio Liano and Doppiano. And uh, the festival is in June. And there is a man uh, with the, um, a man um, slash dwarfish <laughs> that swim in the sea, and a lot of fishermen that they um, are um, catching. Uh, they are uh, doing. The it's a, like a pantomime. Uh, an um, yes, like a pantomime, and uh, it's a caricatural uh, pantomime, like yeah. in the crater. So. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for this really exciting presentation. I hope it will be as so many questions <laughs> to the presentation. And now uh, I have a ple pleasure to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Magdalena Nowakowska, and I am from uh, Faculty of Archaeology, University of Warsaw. And today I would like to present you uh, uh, my project, a uh, project which, uh, for, whom, uh, for which I am a coordinator, a uh, project in Failaka, and fishing activities in the Arabian Gulf case of Failaka Island community tools practice. Uh, of course, everybody knows, but I would like to remind to uh, everybody the definition of underwater cultural heritage. Uh, it uh, means all, tra all traces of human existence having a cultural, historical, or archaeological character, which have been partially or totally under the water, periodically or continuously, for at least 100 years, such a, what is for me very important, sites, structures, buildings, artifacts, and human remains, together with their archaeological and natural context. And our project, Waterfront and Underwater Archaeology of Kuwait, are co risk on the coastal zone around Failaka Island, uh, Kuwait, uh, was established in 2012 and we start to work on it in 2013. It is uh, under the, the project uh, 
is uh, provided under the agreement of Warsaw University, uh, Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology and uh, National Council of Culture, Arts and Letters, State of Kuwait. And the aim is to detect and describe remaining uh, of archaeological sites at the seashore in tidal area, as well to provide documentary evidence and finally organize the proper preservation so that the discoveries uh, could serve further educational uh, opportunities. Execution of bathymetric map is as well uh, and the reconstruction, reconstruction of the original uh, shoreline is as well one of the aim of uh, that project. And I would like to tell you a little bit uh, uh, about Failaka. Failaka is a small island which is uh, located in the uh, north part of Arabian Gulf. Uh, it belongs to the Kuwait state. It is a link um, about 20 kilometers from uh, Kuwait city. And it's a really small but very rich if we are talking about archaeology of Failaka. Failaka has, uh, this island has uh, land about uh, 20 kilometers, uh, 20 kilometers and uh, it is about 7 to 8 kilometers width. And on Failaka, uh, first uh, sites, uh, the chronology of first sites of first uh, human activity is noticed from the half of second millennium BC and it's continued uh, until, the, uh, until now, but uh, archaeological sites are the last which we are, uh, exca are, which are the excavated. Um, are from the beginning of 20th century. And I would like today to present you some of that's the youngest part of uh, Failaka Island. Uh, basing on the list of location of sites which are located along the shoreline uh, around Failaka, we start our project uh, we conducted the survey uh, in the tidal area. Of course, uh, first of all, we had a map of this location of archaeological site that it was for us a little bit easier uh, to start with our searching for something which uh, is uh, twice minimum twice uh, a day under the water and only in a short time un uncovered during the low tide. And according to, and during the last six uh, seasons, uh, we um, reported uh, and make a documentation of 35 archaeological sites which are around Failaka Island. Most of them, it is two generally it's a two groups of this uh, kinds of, most of them it's a stone uh, structures and they are divided generally in two groups. Uh, the first is the harbors and remains of harbors and anchorages and the second is different kind of fish trap. And today I focus, I would like to focus on the special kind of uh, fish trap, stone tidal wires. It's mean long, uh, long linear stone structures which are located in a huge, uh, a huge base uh, uh, around Failaka Island, but mostly in the area of north part of the island. On the picture, you can, you can see photos, aerial photos of that structures. And uh, as I told, um, these structures were located mostly in a huge, uh, absolutely flattened uh, area of the bay, and uh, which um, the characteristic is that always uh, it was not a muddy area, but mostly uh, they are covered by kind of bedrock, uh, and it's mean uh, they are uh, most of them they are uh, some kind of rocky uh, uh, background. And uh, how they were constructed? It was constructed by uh, using stones from the, I suppose, because uh, we still haven't got an uh, um, geological uh, support, but I think that it was uh, made by, it was constructed by stones which were collected from the shoreline. Uh, you can see on Saida Bay, uh, stone, a lot of stones on the shoreline, as well in Alivan, uh, the shoreline is built of, uh, the, shore, uh, the coastline is built from the rock. And uh, people were using, uh, in my opinion, local, uh, local stones, but uh, it was constructed in a one order. Always, uh, it was 
more or less a rectangular shape or uh, some trape trapezoidal shape, the biggest one, and uh, they start with uh, some kind of hook in the beginning. You have a kind of hook and in the arm which is going according to the waves, according to the uh, current, uh, we have uh, some kind of wall with uh, a lot of gaps which you can see here, for example, and there. And as well in a different one, you can report it in, in that part of the, uh, of the structure. Uh, the line which was, uh, which was working as a breakwater, it was very strong. It's mean uh, this here on the north, we have very strong wall. Sometimes it, the height was uh, more than uh, 100, uh, more than one meter. Uh, it should be according to the parallels from the different uh, side of the um, uh, Pacific Ocean, from the different um, well-known uh, stone tidal wires. It should be about one and a half meters high. And uh, you can recognize some special elements in this uh, structure as uh, some kind of pockets, which were located in a part when the uh, waves are going straightly to the breakwater. Here is the pocket. And as well, we can recognize some kind uh, as a thieves. It is kind of pocket with a, some small wall. It is working as a thief and the hook in the beginning. Why? how it's working. Uh, when the waves are going straightly to the, uh, to the wall and the current is going straightly to the, uh, to the highest wall, uh, it is working as a breakwater. And as well, when we have a, a, a low tide and water is going, uh, when low tide is finishing and water is going, uh, it's, come, it's, it's going out, uh, from this from this pool of I'm sorry when the tide is coming water is going in and fish and all of the seafood is coming into the with the waves with the current and when water would like to gun from the structure and it is uh, and the water level is a little bit uh, lower than walls people uh, this, the community of the village a uh, huge group of people coming uh, into the into the structures as you can see for example the saida bay structure for saida bay it is approximately the pool inside the structure is approximately two and a half hectares it means that uh, the if you would like to uh, have a real huge result of our fishing uh, it should be a large group of people, um, minimum, I think, 20 uh, or more people who are going into this, uh, into this area with the nets and slowly, slowly uh, making some kind of barrier and catching uh, fish which are stuck uh, between, the, uh, between the, the walls. But the, the best place for catching fish with, uh, with where we have an accumulation, uh, it's, of course, pocket and of course, some kind of thieves. All of these places, they are very rich for the fish and they belong to the owner of uh, the fish trap. And the second is who was the owner of this uh, fish trap, the stone tidal wire. Uh, from the, uh, some kind of sources from interview, from the uh, written sources about how to build a harbor, uh, we think that it was similar to the techniques of harbor. It was a, specially, a special architecture who uh, was rent to the rich family and uh, make a project for the stone tidal wires. And uh, rich family employed some people who were making uh, this kind of trap. After this, people usually uh, Usually they were from the village, it was a local people and they can stay in the village and they can use this trap for themselves as well. But the main product, the uh, most important products, it's mean the fish from the pocket, from the tip, belongs uh, usually to the owner of this, uh, of this fish trap. Um, 
that's uh, it's mean when we are observing this area of this huge uh, construction we uh, can suppose that it was for a, uh, it was huge industry for a kind of fish farm because uh, when when uh, it's possible to catch a fish the best time for uh, catching fish from the fish trap and the best uh, kind of tides we have during full moon and uh, and uh, uh, during the noon Sometimes it's happened that water during the tides is absolutely uncovering huge area and the water is coming with a, the mm, difference between uh, low tide and high tide, high tide sometimes, is, uh, sometimes is there more than three meters. That is really huge and we can only imagine how many fish is coming from the sea to the shoreline. Uh, but half of the month, when we have a half moon, uh, most of these uh, objects are staying under the water and the fishing is not possible. That was, uh, that it means that these techniques of fishing the, from the shoreline, uh, it was depend on the, uh, on the moon, on the face of the moon, and uh, the, the best uh, time for uh, fishing was twice a month. And about this construction, uh, I told that it was made probably by stones. Today we can uh, see only the remains of the structure, of the structures, uh, but you can see that some part of the wall, it was really uh, prepared in a very good techniques and is uh, in a very good condition until now. But the uh, arms which are uh, on the side, uh, it's, uh, now they are strongly destroyed, but some gaps in these arms, they were used for the nets. People uh, put the nets on the gaps and as well it's, uh, it was working as a kind of the pockets and uh, it was possible to catch more fish during the uh, low tide. And our work is not only recognized archaeological site because uh, it's now six years when we try to uh, reconstruct it's all this process of fishing, all this uh, tradition of fishing, and how it was, how it was possible. That's uh, from the beginning, uh, one of the point of our, uh, of our project is uh, reconstruction and documentation of maritime cultural landscape of Failaka Island and intangible cultural heritage, its main uh, local interview. Uh, the tradition of uh, this region is that the stories, history of family, uh, are uh, reported by grandfathers to fathers, from fathers to, uh, to children, and we have not enough written sources. That's very important is to make for us interview, and uh, co-author of, uh, of this presentation, Mr. Uh, Shehab, Ahmad, uh, from the beginning, from the beginning, he uh, it's him. From the beginning, he helped me to make this interview as a translator, of course, and as well, uh, he. Uh, Thanks to him, we, uh, I have a lot of information about tradition, uh, the uh, oral information and interview from the local people. And uh, in, 2000, in uh, 2018, we organized some interview with the oldest man from the Failaka Island, Mr. Muhammad uh, Burbaraya. And I, we prepared 45 questions to him, and our, we record our interview. It took us one and a half hour. And now we, are, we would like to prepare some, uh, some uh, publication of this interview, uh, because uh, Muhammad Burabaya, you know, told us some stories which are, uh, which are completely. Uh, I think that disappear, can disappear uh, with him. And uh, when I asking him, asking him about uh, stone tidal wires, because we are asking about everything, about how was the life on Failaka, uh, what is the process of fishing, uh, what is uh, how was the uh, what what we uh, uh, have a kind of fishing, and what was the process of. Uh, fishing from the uh, stone tidal wires, he said that uh, it is very, very old tradition. Very old tradition and nobody remember as well he. 
uh, doesn't remember now how it was. But now they are, uh, the name of this, uh, in Arabic name, uh, these uh, structures uh, are, we call it like a maskar. Now they are calling mas uh, ha uh, maskar harab, what's, what is mean destroyed, uh, destroyed maskar. And maskar, it's a kind of the arch, kind of the pool, uh, which uh, he told me he, he think uh, that people are coming for a catching fish, but it was in really old time that his father and his grandfather, uh, they uh, they not catching fi fish uh, in that techniques, but of course they were using some uh, mascara, but uh, in just uh, a little bit in the other way. And of course we are make, uh, we trying to reconstruct the process of catching fish, and here you can see people are coming to the one of the mascar, it means one, to, one of the uh, stone tidal wire for catching fish, but it's only a group of four persons with the small nets, and they just put the nets to the pool and trying to catch a fish. Of course the result is uh, a little bit poor, not as uh, successful as how it should be, how it was uh, before. But according to the, our observation, we noticed that tools, uh, in my opinion, are still the same as it was used uh, in a previous time. Uh, it's mean they are using, uh, for the catching fish for, uh, from the stone tidal wires, they are uh, using mostly uh, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, landing nets, uh, some kind of uh, sharpen uh, sticks, uh, some kind of uh, of course basket. And one uh, more thing which uh, for us was very interesting, that's the time of our catching fish. Of course, everything uh, depends on the tide, uh, tidal uh, time, but when the water is uh, good for the fishing, when is the shallow water is coming, uh, and if it's the, the best time is the, the night. During the night, uh, fish are uh, swimming slowly, more slowly than during the day. And if you are using some kind of lamp, fish is stuck. They are staying in one position. And in very easy way, all this just a sharpened stick, you can, of course, you can use some kind of harpoon, uh, but it can be only just a sharpened stick. You can catch that fish, or very, in a very easy way, you can uh, collect it to the, to the net and after to your basket. On the, their back, they, are, they were carrying some baskets uh, for collecting, and in the place, uh, like uh, near the pockets, they were using uh, some uh, kind of biggest, uh, bigger construction, of course, made of reeds for the collecting fish. And, uh, what about these people, who it was? I said that it was a rich family and they employ economy and diet. For what? Only as a food? Of course, people in the island, they are depend on, it's, it's a natural way that they are, uh, depend on the sea. And most of them, uh, according to our interview, interview with Muhammad, uh, most of them are fishermen. And most of them, it was uh, as well, a fishermen. But, uh, as well, as you know, for the economy. Fish is product. Uh, some of the fish were, uh, we know it from the, uh, this, uh, from Muhammad, that the tradition is uh, for the Kuwait, for this region, is to drying fish. They cleaning fish, hanging it, cut the head, hanging it, put the salt inside, and uh, leaving in the roof for drying. But some of fish were only cleaning, salted, and pack it in uh, some pockets, and if for family was enough, uh, if they have enough for, uh, for the village, then they, then they sell this fish further or exchange with the neighboring village. And uh, who the people was, where they were living? In the front of our, one of our, uh, of our stone, tidal, stone tidal wire in Haraib El Dasht, we have uh, archaeological site uh, Haraib al Dasht, which is explored now and um, documented by Dr. Agnieszka Pinkowska from the uh, 
Polish Center of Mediterranean Agriculture. And the result uh, of her research is that we have in the front of this bay where we notice more than 10 uh, uh, different kind of fish trap, we have, we have a fishing village. What for me is the most impor important, of course there is a mosque in this fishing village, it's a mosque, it's a, some uh, residential uh, area, house one, house two, and the area, small area in the front of uh, the biggest uh, stone tile wire fish processing area, when you can notice a lot of uh, remains of ashes, uh, of um, coal, and as well fish bones and some kind of oven. Uh, it is uh, very often we were thinking uh, the oven, how they were used, the oven for what? It is ac according to the parallels, uh, how people are living now, how the laborers are eating, probably it's the area for using for the laborers, for people who are active, who are waiting for a fish. They are carrying fish from the sea, cleaning on the sh uh, shoreline, of course, not so close to their houses because, as we know, fish is uh, not... Uh, is smelling, that's uh, especially area, it was a little bit um, further than residential area, that's we have this processing area, and uh, some small ovens where you can sit and prepare fish for your lunch or dinner, and wait again for a, uh, another, uh, another uh, tight, uh, good water for a fishing. Uh, and of course, people from Haraib al Dasht, uh, as I saw, maybe I will go back to the uh, first. If you can see on the general plan, it is location of the Haraib al Dasht, it is a nice bay in the north of shoreline. All this area is, uh, it's, uh, on this area we are, we find more than uh, 10 uh, different kind of fish trap and neighboring, uh, neighboring uh, site. Uh, it's another village, mostly agricultural village and another one is uh, connected with a huge harbor. It's a Saida village. And in the Saida Bay, in a neighboring area, we find as well uh, huge, as huge as this previous one, uh, uh, stone tidal wire. That's, um, I, it is possible, but we are not sure that p people from the Haraib al Dash, uh, they were, uh, they took care not only about uh, Haraib al Dash, but maybe as well for the neighboring area, which you can see here, this huge stone tidal wire of Saida Bay. But of, of course, it's only uh, our suggestion. And uh, what about this changing? What about exchange? Of course, one, uh, first of all, the exchange, uh, this food between uh, neighboring villages uh, in Failaka, uh, it is, uh, in that time, it exists three huge villages. Uh, one is the, as I told you, Saida, second Kurania, and in the middle part of the, uh, of the island we have uh, Kusur uh, agriculture village. The time about I'm, I am talking is the time from the uh, se uh, 17 to uh, 19th century, and some kind of activity still uh, exists in the uh, uh, 20th century. And these people, of course, exchange some goods between the village, as I said, but uh, as well, it was uh, on Failaka, we have um, some structures of harbors and anchorage. One of the most important, it was Al Hodor International Harbor, as it uh, um, now all local peoples are talking that it's an international harbor, and according to the gate, the size of the gate, uh, it is, the gate is 20 meters uh, wide. That's, it means that huge dough, uh, for a huge dough it was bought, uh, it was very well prepared uh, and uh, it was possible to stay in a, uh, in a uh, uh, Al Khodor harbor and as well uh, transfer these goods to the uh, near, for example, Basra, which is laying in the uh, area of uh, Iraq today. 
And another, uh, another harbor, some uh, remains of the uh, breakwater we find uh, in a Kusur, that's, if you can see here, in the small uh, cup. Uh, it, it is only small, uh, small part of the uh, breakwater. It means that as well people from Kusur, Kusur they uh, have some uh, activity or the sailing in a further distance. It's, uh, that's according to the location of Haraib al Dasht and this hugest uh, structure between two harbors, I think that it was absolutely professional fish farm which were used by a professionalist. Another, uh, another stone tidal wire, huge stone tidal wire we have in the south area. And now we are not sure it belongs to the people from Haraib al Dasht or maybe to, uh, to the people who are, uh, were living on the south part. But what we know, that uh, fishing on Failaka is depend on the season as well. For example, uh, sometimes it's better to fishing on the south part of this island, sometimes it's much better uh, to fishing in the north part. It's a seasonal, uh, different for the winter time and different for the uh, summer time. And what is now? What's happened with the stone tidal wires? Why they are not exist until now uh, as an active uh, tool for the fishing? In the 19th century, we know from the, some uh, written sources that it was kind of pandemia on the Failaka. And people, the community of Failaka uh, was uh, depopulated uh, so much. And uh, the best uh, solution for them it was to move to the west coast of uh, Failak Island, to the uh, now Azor location, where they were start to build, build another village and another harbor, where they stay until, until now, and they, some of people are living until now in Azor village. And this tradition start to disappear from the community fishing. Uh, and uh, the most popular became uh, some, uh, light some light structures made in the beginning of reed. Now from the, of course, iron sticks, when the before uh, woolen uh, cotton uh, nets, now metal uh, nets, of course. That the system completely changed from the system of huge com community who has to uh, working together, catching together, and exist uh, as, a, as a community for the uh, some simple sm small families, which became which uh, became absolutely uh, absolutely uh, separated. And what is the program on research perspective? Of course, continuation of our research, geological and hydrogeological studies, preservation and protection of the underwater heritage uh, and the coastal structures under the patronage of UNESCO, and organizing the proper system of exhibition. And thank you very much for your attentions. Thank you. And again, uh, it's me again. Now I would like to invite to the presentation uh, uh, Dr. Maciej Sobczyk from the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw University, uh, who tell us uh, something about between land and ocean, the management of Rapa Nui marine resources. The floor is yours, Maciej. Thank you. So it's a COVID time project. Uh, can we start? In uh, my last visit in uh, Rapanui, ah, thank you. Uh, in uh, 2019, I walking in this coast, and I have some question about uh, landscape. I asking I asking myself I'm asking the fishermen in the coast and uh, later uh, what is uh, closed uh, 
Rapa Nui still is closed and uh, we don't have uh, opportunity working in the terrain, in, uh, in, in the land. But thank you, my friends. We working uh, using the internet. Uh, I have some uh, uh, question. Uh, this person going in uh, in the camp for for looking some places. Uh, my professional uh, life is between between caves, the Rapanui, and uh, high uh, mountains and then. Uh, mountains and then peaks, and this coast uh, it's the it, in in middle. So where are we going? We're going very far away. If you know Rapanui, the other name is Tepito uh, Tehenua. Another in the world, it's the one the most isolated places in the world. Uh, now it's special territory of Chile, but uh, history it's a little complicated. Uh, you can see some some names: the travelers, explorers, and first reachers in the uh, in what visiting and working in Rapa Nui. And uh, now, if uh, someone's have idea for start new projects, it's very important looking in uh, uh, the works the uh, Sebastian Engert, Alfred Metru. It's the Bible, the uh, information about the ethnographic and uh, uh, some historical uh, terms. Uh, uh, typical landscape, the uh, Rapanui, it's uh, platform, ceremonial platforms, Ahu, which uh, monument, mon monumental statue Moai, uh, and uh, sometimes we have some question about the related about the fishing and this cluster uh, structures. Uh, some question the this. Per preliminary ideas. So, what is the accessibility? What what happens the sea currents? Or Ahu have some relations about the catch sounds? What happened with ramps in Ahu? And trumps. We have trumps or we don't have trumps. And what is the relation in art rock and uh, uh, fisher zones? If you visit Rapanui, in you see it's uh, every place in uh, in the land have its names. Uh, now we calculate what in Rapanui we have about 15,000 uh, archaeological sites. Every site has its name. Uh, around the um, 300 the, uh, Ahu platforms. Um, and where we're looking in the coast, in the Fishing zone. We're looking in the work the um, uh, Engert. We have five zones uh, for uh, 
for fishing. Irri, Crustal, Son, Hakaranga, Rua, Jipper, Hanga, Toka, and two, two more. Last, it's for uh, two fishermen uh, and uh, around the island, we have 17 sub zones. And these sub zones have it the far, uh, strong re relation between, uh, between land. But of course, it's uh, more complicated where we're looking uh, mm, geological map the the, mm, the island. Mm, we see very uh, complicated structure. In the coast underwater, this still or more complicated, and we have uh, many natural places for uh, for fishing, for for catching, for hunting. Uh, something about the geography, the, the land. Uh, it's volcanic uh, Island, Terevaca, it's bigger volcan. Uh, Poike, older volcan, and Ranokau, and special ceremonial place which the village Orongo. In uh, in coast, where we're looking, we have different accessibility in in, in the water. In uh, south, hmm? in south coast, we have long, easy access, but we have uh, stronger and uh, bigger wear and uh, current. In, uh, in, in bigger, for bigger fishing, we have in South Peak, where is the currently uh, current it's uh, uh, it's bigger typical fisherman uh, in Rapanui we carry it Ravaika but it's uh, expert the the expert fisherman it's the uh, bigger position, the, the, the fishermen's in Rapanui. Uh, it's uh, Rava Ikama, and still uh, about 40, 50 families working in, in, uh, in high sea, in, in, in the big sea. But in the coastal zone, we have, we have it, but not, 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 not now. We, we have it, uh, this form the, the fishing. Uh, in uh, Hakaranga and uh, Roa, um, fishermen using Totora rafts. Uh, and sometimes still we we see uh, some rafts and uh, canoe for uh, for the ports. Uh, but in uh, the, this first zone, Hakaranga, it's uh, normally collective uh, the shoreline organs. 
uh, small fish, octopus, uh, and uh, everything what we can we see for, for eating. Uh, if you see in this picture, we have short, short times in the, the, the small more. We have access to many places. But here, we have the ceremonial plat platform, one of the biggest Ahu in the Iceland. Of course, uh, in uh, this traditional uh, fishing in Rapanui, uh, catching uh, in the night using uh, lights, uh, still uh, uh, some person uh, fishing in this form. Uh, in uh, Metru, we have small uh, draft uh, about the uh, fishing the Here Korea uh, for Murena. Uh, uh, it's very nice ethnographic uh, drafts. Uh, of course, uh, most popular uh, still for uh, weekend for Sunday, uh, some person going and fishing in traditional form. Uh, so using the how the the metal no, the um, the stones the bones of combinate typical the Polynesian hogs. And uh, today, about 20 families living from uh, uh, hunting uh, fishes and uh, uh, and uh, lapses. Uh, if uh, we see. Uh, Information, the first uh, expedition, we have information about, uh, about the uh, very good s swimmers in, in Rapanui and still, still this working and uh, many, many personnel uh, working in uh, d d diving for, for, for hunting. Especially in this time, the uh, the, the COVID uh, time, what Rapanui is closed, uh, and uh, some parts the people uh, working in the water, some parts in the uh, working in uh, in uh, agriculture. Uh, so uh, now we are going to uh, architectural. Uh, parts. Uh, one the uh, structure uh, relationed uh, with uh, fishing, perhaps it's the complex the uh, the towers, tupas. Uh, now uh, conserved 27 tupas. You see in in the map localization. Of course, the first draft, the, the expedition to Peru, uh, now in many, uh, many tops, uh, many topas, it's in the in process, the uh, restoration. Uh, other place, uh, uh, relationed with Fishing zones, it's uh, coastal caves. Uh, some caves uh, in in the in the bays, which the Anakaitangata, 
it's very special caves in this place, but if you see in the picture, it's not only one caves. We have, uh, in, in, in the cast, we have hundreds, hundreds of uh, uh, caves. It's, it's here we looking from Anna Cave and Gata in the mouth and, and the other caves in the, in the coast. Uh, around, around, uh, looking around the island, we have many caves. What it's the opening in the in, in, in the coast. Uh, in uh, some the, these caves uh, have it excavated in uh, expedition the Heyerdahl and really, and. Every time we have uh, some parts uh, relacionated with the uh, fishing. In, uh, in many uh, questions about the zone of fishing, what we looking at uh, and what we now collecting data, it's the um, uh, um, arts rock. Uh, thank you the work the uh, Georgia Lee and uh, and Harley. Uh, we have maps, general maps uh, about the fish localization, the fish motif, which the uh, the the, the over zone the, around the Island. Uh, some the uh, over sea animals uh, and every every time this uh, uh, mm, points the mm, art the, the rock art uh, have it uh, relation which uh, uh, ceremonial platforms, Ahu. So, sometime it's, we have to uh, draft the canoe with the pa pa uh, Papavaka is the bigger, most famous complex, the art. Uh, so, if we looking the uh, Ahu and Moai, these ceremonial uh, places, but uh, it's a very util architecture. So, in uh, Polynesia, uh, we have always we have uh, practical people. It's not. Uh, uh, work only for ceremonial place. Uh, always we have some to uh, over activity. In uh, this area of photos, we see here ramps. This complex uh, have uh, work the reconstruction in. Uh, uh, 17 and uh, 18 years, the uh, 20th century. Um, North American archaeologist uh, William Malloy, who started uh, working in Rapa Nui, which Thor Heyerdahl uh, reconstruct, it's the chief, the reconstruction, the many structure, ceremonial structure in, in, in the Island. But if we look in the over platforms, uh, what we have the, uh, through context uh, conservation, we have to um, platform which ramp. For now, we uh, collecting uh, 25 platforms which ramp, which ramp, but not every uh, platforms, but well, no, no, 
not every ramps, uh, using for uh, for boats. But if you, we see every every uh, uh, platform which ramp have it fresh water, uh, and some ramps it's very steep. And uh, it's true what we now we looking uh, what's happened for this. For this reason, construing a ramp, it's uh, in, in, this, in, in these places. Maybe uh, have it only re relation with, uh, with fresh water. But, of course, this have it some possibility for uh, fishing, for mixed uh, waters. So, here it's the one the, with the very steps, the platforms. So, it's the sum uh, cost uh, what we have in the first uh, uh, picture, but now from drone and, and which sold, and we see every cost, every line the cost from Akahanga to Poike. It's uh, many buys, natural harbor, uh, some place which Subaquatic caves, which here, and still, still we have more question. What's using have at some places in this zone? Of course, in Rapanui, people not need. Uh, Construct some tramps, have it natural tramps at low tide and it's working. Still, every Sunday, every afternoon, uh, many people fishing and preserve the traditional technique. But if we see using I mean, using still traditional and new technique. <laughs> but for killing small fish, using traditional technique. So, thank you. It's everything. Thank you, Magic. Thank you very much. And uh, the last, but of course not least, presentation for today. Uh, now we are sailing back to the Europe, and uh, we would like to hear something about the ancient harbor of Le Hayon, wooden structures in harbor building during the late antiquity. Uh, Panagiotis Ana Anaso. Anatasopoulos, <laughs> I'm sorry if I make a mistake, <laughs> from Danish Institute uh, at Athens, University of Ljubljana. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a long-awaited participation for me at the conference here in Warsaw. I was supposed to be here many years ago, already from 2017, but finally I'm, I'm here. Um, and we will move back to Europe, to the borderline of Europe, actually. And we will talk about the, the ancient harbor of Lechion in Corinth, Greece. Uh, Corinth is located on the um, southeastern part of the Peloponnese. This is Greece. This is the Peloponnese Peninsula. And it's this exact uh, uh, geographical position of Corinth that explains the crucial impact the city had in the ancient world and in all known maritime trading routes. Um, because for the Corinthians, they had access uh, on both sides 
of Greece in essence. Uh, so it was inevitable for them to turn to the sea and create the, the necessary and the suitable maritime infrastructures. And, and indeed, they, they, they built two harbors, one over here, the harbor of Kechre, facing the east, therefore having access to the eastern Mediterranean, uh, and the harbor of Lechion to the west, having access to the Corinthian Gulf, and therefore to the western Mediterranean, uh, which was an area that was quite important for the Corinthians so that they could uh, trade to Italy mainly and then further uh, out in the Med. Okay, this is, this, is the, this is the site, this is the harbor of Lechion, the harbor area, and the first thing that somebody can, uh, can notice is, first of all, the, the size of the area. Uh, just the harbor front is more than one kilometer, and then it also extends inland for the same distance. So we're talking about an area of around 170 to 200,000 square meters, really, really big. And the other thing that one can notice is that it lacks any natural feature that would uh, sort of excuse the, 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 the building of a port. And the question is why did the Corinthians and later the Romans went on and built a harbor there? And, and the answer is quite clear because it, it, it gave them a clear gateway to the west, to Italy, which I said before it was quite important for the Corinthians. Uh, and also it was quite close to the city of ancient Corinth. We're talking about a distance of less than three kilometers. Therefore, it could be easily uh, be incorporated in the city walls and therefore protected. This is a, a flyover uh, of the area from uh, the east. You can see the, the difference between the, the rough outer uh, harbor because we said before it was completely exposed to the north, northwestern winds, uh, as opposed, as I said, to the calm uh, waters in the inner harbor. So what they did is that they used uh, this big wetland area and they dredged the site accordingly so that they create the, 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 the infrastructures they needed. That means like uh, canals and harbor basins. And, uh, what, what you see mainly is uh, the alterations of, of, of the Romans with some later Byzantine additions. So that's the image we have now, and that's what you also see uh, now. Um, the first uh, phase of, of the harbor construction should be placed, according to the, to the written sources, to 600 BC. And then the, the area in the harbor remained in use until at least the 14th century AD. Uh, and we, we, we do know that the area was also used almost until the 19th century, not as a commercial place, but more as a landing place again because of its proximity to the city uh, of Corinth. And the first two uh, structures that somebody will notice when they sail from the west to the, to the port is those two large stone molds that they would also function as breakwaters. And this is from the west coming into the port area, into the harbor area. This is one mole and this is the other one. Both moles are like more than 70 meters uh, long, 15 meters wide, built uh, with Aslar uh, masonry, uh, quite typical Greek construction. Uh, and what we did uh, was to, to excavate down to the foundations. Uh, and we did find, obviously, a lot of ceramic finds. However, uh, it's preserved in three courses, at a height of three courses. However, uh, excavating in the open waters, uh, the results that you get, the ceramics that you get, is not the safest way to date a structure because it's exactly it's on the surf zone. Uh, the stratigraphy is mixed. So what, what you're getting is not the best 
things that you can use to, um, to date. So what, what we did is to move a bit further inland uh, and do some uh, relatively deep uh, core drilling, as, as it happens to many sites like that, as it should happen to the sites that extend in space and time, this is the safest way to date combined with your archaeological material coming out from the excavation. So what we did, for example, in this case, we did a couple of drills in, in between the two moles and we were able to establish that this area, this basin in between the two moles was used from 500 to 300 BC as a basin. And this wouldn't have happened without the, the drills and the geoarchaeology. In general, without geoarchaeology and geomorphology, it's very difficult to study an area and a port of that size. And, and similarly, as we, as we moved towards the inland, towards the wetland area, uh, and we, we performed small-scale excavation, and by sm small scale, I only mean uh, compared to the size of the site, what we, what we realized uh, is the state of preservation in this wetland area. This is something that is quite common for colleagues from Poland or North Europe. In, in, in Greece, in South Europe, you don't get that level of preservation and that detail in organic material. But apart from that, apart from what you would expect in a wetland area, as we saw before, the, the, the intriguing part in Lecho is that we had the same level of preservation uh, also in the water. So we, we had so far four uh, different areas of uh, wooden structures, harbor related structures, uh, all of them being actually around the entrance canal. So you see the four different areas marked in red, and this is the entrance, the L-shaped entrance canal. So all the, the remains, the wooden remains found in the water are around the entrance canal. And there must be a reason for that. We can discuss about it uh, uh, later. So the, the first area uh, consists of uh, six wooden caissons, six wooden formworks, boxes, if you want, um, placed uh, end to end vertical to the shore. Each one of the boxes is 10 meters long by five, and the height is 80 centimeters to one meter. The, this is after the excavation, actually. This is under the water. Uh, I will need to apologize to my colleagues from Vistula River about the visibility. We, uh, we, we discussed, and, and the professor here, we, we discussed about it before, anyway. Uh, so this is after the excavation. The construction of the of the caissons is is pretty simple and straightforward. You have um, uh, side planks, um, and then you have semi-round posts directly nailed on the planks. In, be in inside those boxes, uh, there is a rubble fill of irregular sized stones. And also there is mortar applied inside for insulation. Uh, also based on, on the excavations, and this is another, uh, these have been very well documented, and there is, obviously there is a large beam holding the entire structure together. And, and based on, on, on the excavation of the caissons, uh, we can also determine that there is a, there is a wooden floor uh, and smaller beams keeping the entire structure together. And, and you can clearly see the line, I hope, of, of what those caissons create, which probably they create some, some, some sort of a, of a mold. This is the excavation. Uh, the planks are made of Pinus negra, which is a type of pine that can be found in the Peloponnese, in the mountains of the Peloponnese. And the upright elements uh, are from Greek fir, which is also a species that could be found in the Peloponnese. So the material used was nearby. And you see the fill inside.
They are exceptionally well preserved. You don't, you don't get that in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea at all. They were covered, as it seems, immediately from, uh, from sediments. Yeah. Either this happened on purpose uh, or not, we, we, we can't tell at this stage. But because of that, they were protected, even in, in an open water uh, environment. Uh, then on the other side of the entrance canal, to the, to the east, uh, we have a similar area of wooden caissons. They are 11 this time, same size, same construction more or less. Uh, but in this case, uh, they are not placed vertical to the shore. They are, um, they are sort of scattered in a way to create a platform, which is something that you would expect near the entrance canal. You would expect to have like a larger platform for loading and unloading. The difference here is that the, um, they are preserved in really shallow waters. Uh, most of the structures are like in, in, in less than 50 centimeters of water. So that means that they're really exposed, they're really on the surf zone, uh, they are endangered, and in reality, you, you, you shouldn't even excavate them. You should only try to protect them for future excavation. And again, you see the, the line, which is quite clear of, of the structure. Then the next area with, with, with wooden remains is uh, adjust, adjacent and very close to the, to the west branch of the entrance canal, uh, which is again uh, consisting of large blocks, quite typical of Greek, Roman, and even a bit later Byzantine times. Um, and in this case, what, what, what we might have is a repair phase because you have a line, a, a row of 36 posts, wooden posts, uh, quite close to the, to the blocks uh, of, of the entrance canal, and then in between uh, those two, you have a rubble fill. So this looks like a repair phase uh, of some sort quite later than the construction of the, of the canal. I forgot to tell you before uh, that uh, the C14 dating gave us, uh, for the Caissons at least, uh, uh, a date um, in the mid fourth century AD. Uh, which actually corresponds quite well with, an, with um, the very rare epigraphic evidence that we have from Corinth. Um, so there is an epigraphy saying that there were some harbor works between 350 and 358. So it seems to be part of that, uh, of that construction. Uh, the posts here are, uh, they're quite eroded in this case. Uh, they are 130, in, in length and the diameter is about 13 centimeters. They're made of white oak, which again is a species that could be found in the mountains of the Peloponnese. Uh, the, the date here is a bit later, so we're, we're now moving into the mid fifth century. The, the rubble field again is irregular sized stones, quite compact. And there are 36 posts, where I didn't say before. And, and the last uh, structure actually is, um, again, east of the, of the entrance canal. Uh, in essence, we have two relatively long rows of posts, which you will see here slightly better. So it's, as we call it, structure one and structure two. These are lines of posts. Uh, you, you see how densely they are placed on this side, uh, both rows of posts, to me at least, they belong in the same structure because yet again, we have another rubble field in between the two structures. Why there is a difference now in the density of the, of the posts, we can't be sure yet. I am assuming um, that this, because the blocks here were also used at the same time when this was built, then there was not a necessity to build quite densely. But this is just my theory now. Again, I'm up for discussion if you want. Uh, and outside also what, as I said, in between you have a rubble field and outside there seems to be um, just 
like bedrock, in essence. So you, you have different layers of sediments. Uh, so that means that this signals the, the end of the construction, whatever that was. The analysis, again, as I said before, white oak, something that, uh, you know, species that could be found in the Peloponnese, so quite convenient for them to use material that was nearby. And, and the date, according to the C14, uh, for this particular structure was uh, mid 6th to mid 7th AD. So we're even moving a bit further now. And again, you see the, the branch here. We didn't excavate all the way down again because we also needed to protect that. This, as I said again, and I will repeat, it's quite exposed. It's on the surf zone. The depth is uh, a meter and a half, more or less here. And in general, in what you saw, the depth today is a meter and a half. This obviously would have changed a lot, but again, this is a, a, a topic for a presentation by itself because the entire Corinthian Gulf is quite uh, active uh, seismically. So you have uh, earthquakes every two weeks, and I'm not even uh, exaggerating now. So that means that what, what we see now would have been completely different. And even uh, the geoarchaeologists and geologists are, uh, are arguing between them on, on, on the effect that this seismic activity had on the structures around the Corinthian Gulf and to the landscape, in essence, and the seascape, which would have been quite different. Just to tell you now, we have foundations in, in, in this area that are in uh, today's depth of uh, five and a half meters, which would have been impossible to, to place foundations of five and a half meters. So that means that there is, you know, a lot of movement in, let's say, uh, and this is, uh, this is the team behind what you saw, the Lechion Harbor uh, project team. Uh, the, uh, the project is a collaboration between the Danish Institute at Athens, the University of Copenhagen, and the Greek Ministry of Culture. Um, we started in 2014. Uh, we are now done with the first phase, let's say, of, of the excavations. Uh, we are in a process now to publish everything in, in, in two monographs that will hopefully come out quite soon uh, and also to continue the excavations because there are still a lot of things to be, to be found. Um, it's an international team. Uh, you, you all been to, to such cases and teams and uh, sites and you know how rewarding it is to combine forces with colleagues from all over the world. I think it's the best part in our uh, in our work. Um, that's that. I think I think I'm done. Also on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are a little bit delayed, but uh, still we have time for a uh, discussion. That's, let's start from the first uh, speech, Fishing reality, uh, Rituality in Sicily from Prehistory to the Modern Age. Any question? Please. I would like to say that I appreciate your uh, speech very, very much, really. But I have one question or um, remark or doubt concerning those uh, eyes uh, shown on the uh, ships. Does they really look like the fishes ones? Because they normally, I'm not a marine biologist, but uh, for me, uh, fishes has uh, circular uh, eyes. Moreover, they do not have eyelids, which are visible here. So they rather look like human eyes or maybe mammals eyes, but not fishes ones. Okay, uh, so this is just an idea because uh, we are now searching something in the sources. But uh, I thought that we have a lot of attestation of these eyes uh, also in the modern culture, not um, for the Greece, for other, um, other parts. 
and uh, I think it's uh, a good thing to, um, I don't know, because definitions uh, put also this in the coins. So maybe it can be a, rela um, it can be a relation uh, between these and be between the iconography of the eyes. But, but uh, of course, as you said, it's uh, typical for the, for the sheep. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Maybe any question more to this interesting subject about fishing? things I was glad to see the fishing with the lime uh, because uh, in Sicily we have the same now uh, in Acitressa where there is the festival of the swordfish and it's uh, basically if I show you some picture the same from the rocks uh, to the sea the same kind of, uh, of fishing so I, I can see the I don't remember the name sorry uh, for between land and ocean uh, Okay. No, but, but it's okay. It's just uh, okay. No, I I am just wondering that in Sicily we have the same kind of fishing with the line. Now, uh, so I, uh, I'm glad to see the um, the kind of fishing. Just this. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. Uh, this kind of fishing with the line that you show before, we have the same in Sicily uh, in the um, in the east part yeah, of the city. It's typical, yeah. it's, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful because from the rock is the same, uh, just this. Thank you so much. Any more questions to the fishing on Sicily? For me it was absolutely exciting, these techniques, and if I well understood, you are the first group, the first project, uh, and people who start to collect all this information yeah, about traditional fishing. It's very important for the intangible heritage. That's a uh, congratulation. <laughs> yes, and now, uh, any question to uh, my speech about Failaka Island? Let's go to the next speech. <laughs> Yes, something about fish traps, stone tidal wires, uh, maybe you would like to know something more. I think that we need to talk to some, <laughs> some interview with the local people because uh, this is the second step and uh, it's very important. Do you want to say something? I don't know because <laughs> it's just for this. Uh, Thank you. Margaret, I have one question for you. And do you have any idea where they were uh, acquiring the salt for the fish processing? Uh, have you observed any traces of uh, salt processing facilities uh, close to the fish uh, as well? Maybe some shallow uh, pools for the vaporizing the salt water or something? Or uh, they were just uh, buying the salt from the other islands? Um, in Haraib al Dasht. As I know, we haven't got an object like this, but I suppose, but I don't know a now result because everything is under the, uh, uh, now we have only some uh, small reports and no huge publication from the different group because on Failaka is working several expedition. And some of them, I think that it's possible that they have some, uh, some kind of pools for the uh, salt production, but I'm not sure. And in fact, we have in some small village in the north uh, shoreline, uh, but from the east side, some remains of the, probably from the tents uh, for drying fish. That's maybe, this is that area where they uh, as well product the salt, but I'm not sure it is not uh, uh, our mission project. <laughs> Thank you. Any more question? Yes. Thank you. I think it's very interesting having this touch on the Middle East and coming from the European side. Um, being that you were there researching, um, what, what have you seen as the role of women in this fishing seascape? Have you noticed anything?
Uh, as I know, the fishing, uh, some process of fishing was most important for a man, but not exactly. For example, in Taiwan, uh, of course, it's a very uh, far from, the, from this area, but in Taiwan, all village is fishing. Everybody, because it's a short time, uh, the water uh, it's in a good layer uh, level, it's staying maybe one hour or less uh, sometimes, and whole village is coming for the fishing because uh, it's only twice, uh, twice a month. That's, I suppose, only suppose that women can help as well, but for sure uh, they were involved for the uh, process of uh, cleaning fishing uh, and salting and preparing for the, as a food for preparing for a dry, uh, drying and as well for preparing in a, uh, some pockets, some uh, packing uh, as uh, goods for a, a sale. Uh, it's, it was fresh fish with the salt only, not drying fish. Drying fish was, was prepared only for the uh, local people for the uh, next season. That's, uh, I haven't got an, uh, I'm not so sure, but I think that uh, the process of fishing, it's possible it was for whole village important. Thank you. Some more questions, please? <laughs> okay, that's, uh, let's go smoothly to the Rapanui Island and another technique of fishing. Any question for Maciek, for someone would like to ask? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One question for Maciek, because uh, it was uh, very interesting for me uh, I mean, this diving, uh, so breath-holding divers uh, or breath-holding fishermen, do we have any information concerning the depth they reach and the time they spend under the water? Because that's, uh, it used to be in later times a very popular occupation, but nowadays it is not, so we may compare it with AMA in Japan or in Korea, uh, but, uh, or Polynesian uh, pearl divers. So, or sponge divers, so, but, but I think that it is very important to have such an occupation still vivid. So, do, they, uh, do we have any information concerning uh, the time span? And diving, uh, if I asking some person, diving about the 20, 30 meters regular, but with guys uh, swimming in the coast which the small raft and diving many times many times to 20 30 meters and uh, going to small caves uh, for uh, hunting the uh, langust yeah maybe yeah I don't know. I, uh, this I can't. I, so I need asking for this. I, I, I don't know. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe someone else with a question about fishing in Rapanui in tidal waters. Any question? <laughs> Unfortunately, Magic, we have, you haven't got there any structures, stone structures, but I can be only jealous about this natural shoreline, perfect for fishing in the tidal area. Thank you for the exciting uh, presentation. And the uh, last questions for the last presentations are about amazing wooden structure in Lehigh uh, Harbor. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick question, because most of your uh, chronology uh, you based on C14 dating. Did you try to do any dendro with this nice wood? <laughs> okay, uh, this is the step that we are uh, doing now. Dendro chronology, uh, collaborating with Cornell University, because apparently they have a quite large database. Uh, in the region and in, uh, uh, in the period also, if it corresponds. But you're right, dendrochronology is the number one uh, now for what we have. But the C14 was, you know, the, the first uh, aid. 
kind of thing, so that you get an idea of what, what's happening. Yeah. Except the analysis uh, about the species and everything that was already there. Can I actually, sorry, I overheard before that you were talking about the importance uh, of geoarchaeology and everything, like before in the coffee, and you're absolutely right, it's quite essential. It's the only way, actually, to approach life like that. Thank you so much. Any one person with a question? This wooden structure <laughs> in shallow water, yes, please. Since I love the integrity of the whole thing, it's just a phenomenal example. Um, because of this phenomenon, have you thought about digitalization of the whole thing? Because I see you have really good media of everything. I mean, of course, documentation and doing the right thing first, but maybe some project like this? Because in essence, I know what you mean, and yes, digitalizing, let's say, let's use that term, everything would be really nice. Uh, but I, I think for, for us now, uh, archaeology is what matters, and then take that to the public. And, and for now, the, the, the presentation that we have is enough for the public to understand and, and get on board, in a way. Uh, and that goes for schools as well, because we do have a lot of visits from schools. Um, now, in the future, obviously, a, a, a scheme like that would be in, in the plan. But also have in mind that um, this, is, this, is, this is Greece, uh, and there are quite strict laws in terms of archaeology. Um, and, and when you go to these states after archaeology, what, what you do next, then there are a lot of bodies involved. Uh, so we'll just do the archaeology for now. As, as precise as we can, uh, and, and then for the future we will see. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we haven't got any question more, just we can uh, officially uh, we can finish uh, today presentation to, uh, today the, uh, this part uh, of presentation for today. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, all presenters, for a very exciting uh, speech and presentation. And one announcement for the end. <laughs> uh, according to the, our plan, we are on time. <laughs> and we are planning uh, the small excursion to the Museum of Diving. Museum of Diving, it is not a part of our university campus. We have to go there by metro. That's uh, for uh, for members who would like to go with uh, with us to the Museum of Diving. I have a proposition. Let's meet in uh, ten minutes. It's okay. In a ten minutes, in a uh, front of the building, in the front of the door, the main entrance to the university. We will go to the metro station. You need to buy tickets, <laughs> and we will go to the museum. And uh, I think that we spend there about one hour. And for, if you like uh, to talk much more than during this uh, discussion and some couloir, in some couloirs, we have a reservation at 8 p.m. in some small restaurant. Uh, maybe not small, <laughs> she's laughing, in a, some, uh, in a restaurant that for people who would like to join, uh, it is Ceca Oberja, I think that we can, I don't know, Mogosia. We have some food and everybody will receive all. Okay, <laughs> you received an email with the address of this uh, CK Oberja, it is a place when you can eat something, drink something, and just gathering after the, this day. To, uh, tomorrow will be official dinner. That's, this is the end official uh, part uh, for today, and for whom would like to go to the museum, let's meet in 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.